Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello. My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fade away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome the four exciting, talented people who are going to play Just a Minute. We welcome back three of our regular players of the game, that is Derek Nimmo, Peter Jones and Clement Freud, and someone who has only played the game occasionally, Stephen Fry. Would you please welcome all four of them? It's Liz Trot who's going to keep the score and blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And uh, this edition of Just a Minute is being specially recorded for Christmas Eve. So I think probably there'll be a great Christmas feel about the show. And as usual, I'm going to ask the four panellists to speak on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And we'll begin this special Christmas edition with Clement Freud. Clement, will you talk about my favourite Christmas present. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. My favourite Christmas present I was going to suggest would be a pipe of port, until I found that that contained over 800 bottles. And I think, on the whole, I would prefer something that didn't take up as much room. So perhaps a voucher, what my <laughs> grandchildren call a voucher. Uh, like going to Paris on Eurostar and being able to have lunch at uh, our meet. Derek Nimmo challenge. Hesitation. Yes, there was a definite er uh, there. So, Derek Nimmo, you get a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject. There are 33 seconds left. My favourite Christmas present. Something. My favourite Christmas present was given to me a few years ago by my wife. It's a beautiful walnut bureau bookcase of 18th century origin, probably Queen Anne or... Uh, <laughs> Peter Jones challenge. There was a bit of a hesitation. Oh, there was a hesitation, definitely, absolutely, Peter. Yeah. A point to you and the subject, 23 seconds. My favourite Christmas present. That was an electric train which my uncle Harry gave me and it was surrounded by a farmyard which my father contributed and it was a marvellous toy. It was a... <laughs> <laughs> Derek Nemo got in first. Yes, yes Derek. Yes, repetition. It was 13 seconds. My favourite Christmas present, Derek, starting now. When you open the flat, there are all kinds of secret drawers inside it. Stephen Fry. This is just disgusting. <laughs> talking about his wife here. I remember something about his wife giving me a present and then talking about opening her flap and I... finding her drawers. <laughs> Horrific. It is. For Christmas, but, I mean. I, I agree. I mean, it is a very devious thought, but he wasn't deviating <laughs> oh, within enough. the rules of just a minute. So Derry gets a point because it was an incorrect challenge and keeps the subject. Eight seconds, my favourite Christmas present starting it now. It has two doors made of grey glass. They weren't that colour originally, but rather like in 13th Corinthians when you say, <laughs> now <laughs> I see two. <laughs> what's right. well, I don't know what that was, but it was. There's a little <laughs> bit of extra. 13th of the Rose. Yes, we interpret it as hesitation, Stephen. So you got in with two seconds to go on this subject. My favourite Christmas present starting now. My favourite... Oh, and good. Clement Freud child. <laughs> Hesitation, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> My well, favourite Christmas present. I'm going to start before you start the clock now because I, I'm so I, scared of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually one and a half seconds to go, and of course, whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. And it was Stephen Fry who was in second place at the end of the round behind Derek and Nimmo. Peter Jones, what about you taking this one? Who I would like to kiss under the mistletoe? <laughs> Clemens' channel. Juliet. Why? Who? Whom I would like to kiss. <laughs> Um, Peter Jones, would you like to talk on whom I would like to kiss under the mistletoe for 60 seconds, starting now? I'd want to clear this with my wife of 40 years, and I don't think there are many people that she would find acceptable. The Queen Mother, perhaps, would be a good choice, but then one would have to get the permission of Buckingham Palace. Derek Nimmo, Charles. Permission of permission. 
Yes, you had to get your wife's permission first. And now I thought he said I had to clear this approve, with my wife. Clear yeah. this with my wife. I didn't yeah. say I permission. Said permission. Oh, no, right. No, no. I didn't think. Well done. It wouldn't be correct because we have a very kind of open relationship. Yes, it's amazing how much of their life comes out in just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, you have an incorrect challenge, so you get a point and you keep the subject. There are 47 <laughs> seconds left. Whom? I would like to kiss under the mistletoe, <laughs> starting now. Whether it would be at her place or mine would have to be arranged between us. There would be no... Clement Freud challenge. Too many woods. Too many woods. You were saying wood this and wood that. Yes. And we let a few go, but I think... Well... <laughs> Clement, a correct challenge, 41 seconds left. Whom I would like to kiss under the mistletoe, starting now. A mistletoe is a unisexual, parasitic evergreen, rather like Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Derek Nemo challenge. Well, he just sort of stopped. Didn't that was he? enough. <laughs> it's called it's a contribution. Call it's called a contribution. Yes. <laughs> I don't know it's why. It's very well doesn't... received, I must say. Yeah. I like it actually very much. Derek, a correct challenge. Twenty-nine seconds. Whom I would like to kiss under the mistletoe, starting now. I would like to kiss Miss Frieda Baring of Ten Caravan Park, Middledale Lane. Billsorp near Newark, Nottingham. I've had a huge passion for this lady for many years, since I first saw her at the Adelphi Theatre, 21... Um, <laughs> that's a year's end, never mind. It's all gone, it's all gone, never mind. There's a, a hesitation in the yeah, service yes, of avoiding yeah. a repetition, which is always... Right. No, Stephen, so. 11 seconds, whom I would like to kiss under the mistletoe. Well, like an enormous number of people, of course, Douglas Heard features at the top of my list. <laughs> One surely of the most snoggable men the century has ever given birth to. Close after him, you'd have to put Stephen Hendry, and after that, I suppose... Uh... Clement Freud, your challenge. Repetition. Or what? After, after. Oh, oh after, after, after. God. Right. Like Clement, it. a correct challenge, and two seconds on whom I would like to kiss under the mistletoe, starting now. I think nobody on this platform. <laughs> oh. No, Stephen actually got in before the whistle, Stephen. Well, there was a kind of second between there platform and whistle. There was a definite whistle, hesitation, Stephen. As yes. there were only two seconds which I was left with. I know, but you did His stop heart. before the whistle, and Stephen got in, and he's done unto you what you tried to do to him. <laughs> <laughs> and there's half a second, Stephen, for you to tell us about whom you would like to kiss under the mistletoe starting now. Emma Freud, no, obviously. Yes. With, uh... <laughs> So Stephen Fry was once again speaking as a whistle when gained the extra point for doing so. And Derek, it's your turn to begin. Where I hang my stocking. Mm. 60 seconds. <laughs> In one of those flaps you were referring to before, perhaps, I don't know. <laughs> Starting now. I always like my stockings well hung, so I hang them out <laughs> about eight days before Christmas so they're suitably ripe by the time the great feast arrives, Yuletide or whatever. Then I take them indoors, put them in the iron cupboard for a moment or two, and then go into the bedroom. Now, it depends which room I'm in, because in the country I have a four-post, and it's very difficult to put them on the top of the new post. There are how, if I'm in London, I hang them... Peter Jones What do you mean, there how? What, what did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's a sort of... When you've sort of lost yes. rubbish, you say things like that, don't yes. you? <laughs> It's a bit it's of Northampton. Deviation from English as we understand it, or is it normally spoken? <laughs> yes. Peter, correct challenge. 35 seconds are available. Where I hang my stocking, starting now. Well, it happens to be where I am at the time. If I were in the Holiday Inn in Ottawa, I should hang my stocking there. There would be little chance of it ever being filled by anybody because there's no one there I know at all. But if I were somewhere else... Then for a challenge. If I were. Is if I were. Clement, a correct challenge, 19 seconds. Where I hang my stocking, starting now. I am opposed to hanging, and I don't wear stockings. <laughs> but having said that, it is only fair to announce that I would hang them from my suspender. <laughs> uh, Stephen Fry, well, A little bit of a hesitation. Yes, yes after his suspender, yes. Something like that. Six seconds available where I hang my stocking, Stephen, starting now. Well, I'm a bit of an old traditionalist. I like to hang it on the mantelpiece of my bedroom and wait for Santa to fit it uh, any night. Peter Jones. That was a bit of a hesitation. I think so too, mm. Peter. Well, you've got him with one <laughs> second to go on where I hang my stocking, starting now. For Ottawa... <laughs> <laughs> Jones was then speaking as the whistle went, and he's now taken the lead. Stephen Fry, will you take the next round? How I like to spend Christmas Day. 
60 seconds to tell us, <laughs> starting now. Ah, oh, how I'd like to spend Christmas Day. Well, snogging Doug has heard, obviously, but there are other things to be done. I have a large party of guests for Christmas, and, uh, of course, I like to hesitate, as I just did, and I like also to... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> very never <laughs> challenge. Self-confessed hesitation. <laughs> Self-admission, oh, Stephen. 50 seconds. How I like to spend Christmas Day, Derek, starting now. I like to spend Christmas Day in a totally traditional way, surround my children and grandchildren. I will be in the country. They will all be sitting at my knee first thing in the morning to open their stockings. A tremendous ceremony, this. We go through the... <laughs> 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 Unless he's home in the country, he's in Japan. I think that was a deviation of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> 36 seconds for you, Stephen, on how I like to spend Christmas Day, starting now. I have to inspect the Argo first thing, because I left the turkey in overnight and checked that it hasn't dried up, which is the thing that happened. Clement Freud challenge. Two checks. You checked too much. <laughs> so bad at it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Clement, there are 31 seconds on how I like to spend Christmas Day, starting now. Putting a Czech turkey in an Argo is a silly way to spend Christmas Day. <laughs> but what I quite enjoy doing is placing the bird in an oven on the previous night, which would be this evening, if you're listening to the original recording, although the repeat could well backdate. Stephen, <laughs> this is just agony. This is just agony. I, I was wild. We're listening to a turkey cooking overnight here. I'm <laughs> A butterball turkey. Stephen, you got him with the correct challenge. You have 12 seconds to tell us more about how I like to spend Christmas Day starting now. I expect Clement will put me right here, but I'd like to bung the giblets, make a stock, and then to get some kind of chestnut soup going, bubbling away at the back of this said uh, cooker, stove, range, or whatever you like to call it. And meanwhile, there are people to entertain, stockings to open, all kinds of stuff to do. So Stephen Fry was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so, and with other points in that round, he's now taken the lead. And Clement Freud, it's your turn to begin. The subject, brandy butter. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Brandy butter is what you would add to Christmas pudding if you think there is, in that delicacy, an insufficient... Ah. Uh, <laughs> Derek Nemo challenge. He stopped. Yes, we were hesitant. <laughs> Derek, 53 seconds available to you on brandy butter starting now. I'm frightfully keen on brandy butter, as long as there's a lot of cognac within it. I would go to the top one, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we're, we're back in Nagasaki or wherever it is now. <laughs> <laughs> 47 seconds, Stephen. Brandy butter, starting now. Well, I'm sort of with what I assume was the tenor and thrust of Clement's earlier comment, which is that, frankly, Christmas pudding, to me, doesn't need any enriching, especially with sugary things. I preferred cream. But brandy butter is much loved by many. I suppose I ought to repeat now so that, in some way, Clement can interrupt me and give me a good recipe. <laughs> Clement Freud, challenge. The repetition of Clement. Yes. That's it. You spotted it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> He wants to hear more about your brandy butter. 33 seconds left, Clement, starting now. There are really two ways of doing this, and the first one is to get butter and put brandy into it, which you can do with a wooden spoon, especially if the butter is soft. But Derek Nimmo Chow. The addition of butter. No, brandy so butter. Brandy the... butter. Oh, I see. You, we've only been playing the game for 28 years. <laughs> <laughs> But can I remind you, you can repeat the words yeah, on the yeah. card, which Clement did. 23 seconds, brandy butter, Clement, starting now. But preferred methodology is to take the butter and whisk it. Uh, Clement, uh, Stephen, you, your lights came on, but there was no buzz. No, it was, it, he didn't mean it. It was a hesitancy. It was a mistake. It was so gentle. It was a mistake. I just go like that. You see, yes. it lights up. The audience can see it light up, but it doesn't actually buzz. I have to do yes. that to buzz ah. it. But it can just anyway, I it. can assure all the yeah. listeners that, that uh, Stephen Fry's light did come on, though he didn't press his buzzer very hard. What was your challenge? Well, he just seemed to be hesitating a little, uh, but it's so long ago that I've forgotten. I should <laughs> 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 I don't think he has a no, enough, I Stephen. Think 17 well. seconds, Clement. Brandy butter starting now. Counts. Peter Jones, Charles. Uh, hesitation. He did hesitate <laughs> there, yes. But 15 and a half seconds, brandy butter with you, Peter, starting now. I think you should all know that you can make whiskey butter or rum butter or even Tizer butter by the <laughs> same method. So you just mix it up with the butter, add a little sugar if you don't think it's sweet enough, and then put it in the fridge until the time comes to serve the Christmas pudding. <laughs> Two 
Andrew Jones was then speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point. He's now equal with Stephen Fry in the lead. And, Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject, how to avoid a family argument on Christmas Day. Oh, a lot of people are laughing in the audience. There seems to be familiar ground. Uh, 60 seconds, as always, Peter, starting now. Give everybody in the house, first thing in the morning, a large glass of orange juice, well laced with tranquilizers. <laughs> This way, you'll have a lot of peace for most of the day, and if they need topping up, then you, that's what you'll do. You'll get a family size box of these little pills, which can be bought in the black market fairly cheaply, and uh, if that doesn't work, then... Uh, Stephen Fry, I just sensed a bit of hesitation there. Am I, I'm probably being over strict. I think you were, yes. Yes, I think I probably am, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think you're being a bit over keen, yes. Yeah, I think so, it. yes. Carry so, on, Peter. So, uh, an incorrect challenge, Peter, another point. 35 seconds. Did you not see my light go on? <laughs> I definitely didn't see your light go oh, on, Clement. Yeah. 35 seconds, Peter. How to avoid a family argument on Christmas Day? The other way is to go and live somewhere else on your own, <laughs> in a caravan. You can avoid it. In Sydney, in Australia, there are cruises that leave uh, the bank... <sighs> Derek Nemo, There was yes, a right. there, Peter, yes. 24 seconds, Derek. How to avoid a family argument on Christmas Day, starting now. I think I agree with Peter. The best thing is to go as far away as possible, possibly to Ho Chi Minh City, which used to be called Saigon, and you would have very few friends there and certainly no family. That would be the absolute ideal way of avoiding an... Peter Jones, a challenge. I have an aunt in Ho Chi Minh City. <laughs> the point is, she's not related to me. <laughs> so you've answered his challenge, Derek, but give Peter a bonus point. Nine seconds available, Derek. How to avoid a family argument on Christmas Day starting now. Then I would stay in my bed the whole of the day, right the way through. Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of day. Well, yes. It's on the card, Christmas, actually. It's on the card. Wake Christmas up, Day. Nicholas. You nearly gave it to him. Derek, another incorrect challenge, another point to you. Five seconds still available. How to avoid a family argument on Christmas Day, starting now. If you don't speak at all, then nobody can have any kind of row with you, particularly if you are in... <laughs> so, at the end of that round, Derek Nimmo got the point speaking as whistle went. It's very even, actually. There's only about one point separating all of them, but Peter Jones is just in the lead. Uh, Derek, your turn to begin, keeping the Christmas theme going. How Father Christmas gets down the chimney is the subject. Just a minute, starting now. How Father Christmas gets down the chimney, with difficulty, I would say. It is one of the great puzzlements, but he always does. It's so kind, after weeks and days of tremendous... <laughs> Peter Jones, there was a hesitation. There was a hesitation when the weeks and the days. Yes, I agree, Peter. 49 seconds. How far the Christmas gets down the chimney, starting now? Really, quite easily, because anybody who can get four reindeers onto the roof will have <laughs> no problem getting down the chimney, with or without difficulty, who is one of the leading reindeers. Clement Freud challenged. It's the fifth reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> you had some reindeer before. Oh, did I? Yes. Mm. So, yes, Clement, I did. I did. Yes. you have a repetition <laughs> challenge and 37 seconds to tell us something about how Father Christmas gets down the chimney, starting now. In a word, smoothly. And having come down the chimney, he then prepares turkey ding, which is what he... Uh, oh, Stephen Fry Sorry, challenge. I thought he'd stop there, but he, he wasn't. He was carrying on. He it was, was hesitation. It was hesitation, wasn't yes. it? Yes. 28 seconds. You will never available. know how to make turkey ding. <laughs> <laughs> you will be sorry about it. <laughs> I will be sorry, won't I? So I'll repeat myself very subtly. I may say uh, your name again twice. 28 seconds for you, Stephen. How far the Christmas gets down the chimney, starting now. Well, in a word, perhaps sootily. Uh, unless, of course, people don't... Derry Nemo. Sootily. Ah. Da. Da. <laughs> he's, he's on the case, isn't he? Yes, you can't yes. take it away from him. 25 he's seconds for you on the vicious, subject. He's right. Derek. Starting now. I think it's very kind of Mohammed al Fayed to allow him out for the day when he's been slaving in the house for all those months in advance. And I... Clement Freud challenge. Deviation. Why? I don't believe in al Fayed. (laughs) (laughs) 
A bonus point to Clement because we enjoyed the challenge, but he wasn't actually deviating. So it's 17 seconds available still for you, Derek, on the subject starting now. But thankfully, Father Christmas always does get down. And with his jolly face and a great sack of toys, he goes to my stocking, fills it up, puts a mince pie beside it, drinks the glass of sherry which I've left for him, and then goes up to... Peter Jones' know. challenge. Father Christmas doesn't put the mince pie there. <laughs> He takes them in spy, if you're generous enough to give him one. Isn't that right? Well, I don't know. I mean, this. Yes. I think the audience wants you to win, Pete. <laughs> Very nice. So, all right, they've decided, this audience, in their wisdom, has decided that it's, uh, Father Christmas is given a mince pie. He doesn't leave one. So you've got him with two seconds to go on how Father Christmas gets down the chimney, Peter, starting now. Slides down, just like a weight being dropped. <laughs> End of that round, Peter Jones is still in the lead. He's three ahead of Derek Nimmo, and then Clement Freud and Stephen Fry one behind him. Stephen, your turn to begin the subject, the worst Christmas cracker joke. Mm. I don't know whether you can remember any of them, but please try and talk on the subject. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. I remember one last year. How many ears has Davy Crockett got? Answer, three. A left ear, a right lug, and a front ear, which, of course, is not a repetition of the auricular organ because it's a single word. Another one which I liked was, how do monkeys make toast? The answer to that one is they put it under a gorilla. Uh, while in the jungle, why is there no aspirin there? Because the parrots eat them all. Um, I... <laughs> Clement Floyd challenged. Uh, it's enough. <laughs> I'm afraid the audience came in so quickly I didn't hear what you said, Clement. I would love to know what it was. It just said, enough. Enough? Oh, no, give him a bonus point for a good challenge, but... Uh, Nicholas, wasn't... if you can't hear as well as everything else, <laughs> you really ought to retire. <laughs> Stephen Fry. Yes. You've got a point for an incorrect challenge. Clement Fry got one, a bonus point for, because the audience enjoyed his challenge, which I couldn't hear. And there are 30 <laughs> seconds left on the worst Christmas cracker joke starting now. I suppose the worst Christmas cracker joke would be to have Frank Carson point at the cracker on your plate and go, hey, that's a cracker. But, um, <laughs> there are others. Clement Fry challenged. Hesitation. No. He was. 23 seconds. He was riding a laugh. <laughs> yes. The worst Christmas cracker joke starting now. There was one which said, I won't say it was a small town, but the speed limit signs were back to reverse. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I would have had to repeat back. How terribly unfortunate. Peter Jones, <laughs> Hesitation. Yes. <laughs> Peter, 16 seconds for you to tell us the worst Christmas cracker joke starting now. Vicar at the village concert. Miss Brown will now sing when I am in my little bed, accompanied by the curate. <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Yes, Clement. Well, no, I just stopped. <laughs> no. you, you waited for your laugh and you got it. Mm -hmm. Clement, seven seconds. Tell us the worst Christmas cracker joke starting now. It's no good going to bed early to save candles if the result is twins. Could be just about... <laughs> Clement Freud speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point. Clement, your turn to begin. The subject is Twelfth Night. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Twelfth Night is... Oh. Uh, <laughs> Clement, Steve. Yes, Stephen. Bit of Peter Ernie. 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 It was early. I'm Peter sorry. Ernie. Was that cruel? It, it was cruel, but it was correct. Oh, I didn't mean to be cruel. No, 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 no. It's just goodwill. No, no, no. I'll give no. it back to you after a bit, no. uh, Clement. No, no, he's been way tough with you, 59 and a half seconds to go. <laughs> yes, quite. I've lost the course, I'm going to be honest. 
57 and a half seconds, 12th night, Stephen, starting now. Generally known as one of Shakespeare's festive comedies, subtitled, of course, What You Will, and set in Illyria, and starring, if that's the right word, personnel, including Olivia and Viola and Tutston and Andrew Cruikshank and no one can't be right, <laughs> 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 Yes. <laughs> It's a repetition of the ho. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. He was laughing his own joke of Andrew Crookshank. <laughs> 48 seconds for you, Clement, on Twelfth Night, starting now. January the 6th, or the Feast of the Epiphany, is what Twelfth Night is about, but also, as my friend and colleague on my right said so very properly, a Shakespeare play written in 1601, starring... <laughs> Stephen Fry. I didn't say properly that it was a Shakespeare play written in 1601. <laughs> He, he ran the sentence on. <laughs> I, I didn't hear any punctuation in his speech there, as my yeah. friend... I mean, admittedly, um, Clement, Clement is not... Clement. No, 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 yeah, I, I think you made a point. It, it's yeah. a, it was, I think, a very subtle challenge, but it is correct. Stephen, you have the subject, 34 seconds, 12th night, starting now. I'm grateful to Sir Clement for the intelligence that Twelfth Night was written in 1601, which I was ignorant of, I'm afraid. And I will now hand him back by saying Clement again. <laughs> 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 it's a new way of playing just a minute, they sit together and they hand it back and forth between each other. 26 seconds for you, Clement, on Twelfth Night, starting now. I think Malvolio is a part that might have been written for Stephen Fry. It is, in many ways, the ideal role for an actor of his size and sensibility. The twins, on the other hand, should not be played by Peter Jones and Derek Nimmo, <laughs> because only one of them was male, the other called Viola, who had this attachment to the Duke, should, I think, on all accounts, be performed... Peter Jones got in. Hesitation. Yes, on the performed. And you've got in with a second to go, <coughs> Peter, on Twelfth Night, starting now. It's the night after the 11th. <laughs> <laughs> So, at the end of that round, Peter Jones was speaking as the whistle wind gained that extra point. And at the end of this special Christmas edition of Just a Minute, we have a very interesting result. We have three people equal in second place. That is Stephen Fry, Clement Freud and Derek Nimmo. But three points ahead of them was our winner, Peter Jones! <laughs> for me to say on behalf of our four exciting and talented players of the game, that is Clement Freud, Derek Nimmo, Peter Jones and Stephen Fry, Liz Trott who's kept the score so well, Ian Besseter for having a thought of the game and keeping us in work and Anne Jobson who has directed the show and from myself also Nicholas Parsons. On behalf of all of us I must wish you a very happy Christmas. From all of us here goodbye! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fades away, once more it is my pleasure to introduce the four talented performers who are going to play Just a Minute this week. We welcome back two of the long-standing players of the game, that's Derek Nimmo and Clement Freud, and two of our other regular but younger members of the show, that is <laughs> Paul Merton and Tony Hawkes. Will you please welcome all four of them? Uh, this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the International Edinburgh Festival and we're playing here in the Pleasance Theatre before a very animated and exciting fringe Edinburgh <laughs> audience. <laughs> They're getting quite hyped up there. Uh, beside me sits Alison Harbord, who's going to keep the score and blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And as usual, I will ask the four panellists to speak, if they can, on the subject I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Clement Freud, would you begin the first round, and the subject is Tam O'Shanter, a nice Scottish subject. <laughs> So you talk for 60 seconds, starting now. A tam shanter is an item of Scots headgear which, like other Scottish apparel, is worn without anything between the skin and the garment. <laughs> and uh, Derek Nimmo's challenge. Well, surely there's hair. <laughs> Where? <laughs> Uh, 
Clement was referring to the fact that he's a little bit thin on top, and uh, <laughs> but he didn't make it clear that it was on his occasion it would be nothing between the skin and the tamashanta. So, Derek, I agree with the challenge. You have a point for that, of course. You take over the subject. There are 48 seconds left. Tamashanta starting now. Tamashanta is a poem written by the bard of Scotland, Rabbi Burns. It concerns a man who went forth and drank a deal of malt whiskey and returned on his horse, which was called Maggie, and as he passed a particular church, he saw fiends, foul, gross, ghastly, knavish creatures inside the aforementioned place of worship. And <laughs> particularly he saw a lady in a cutty sock. Now that is... Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Repetition of he saw. Yes, he saw. He saw too. <laughs> Clement, I agree with the challenge. You get a point for that. You take over the subject. And there are 20 seconds left starting now. I find it very strange about Tam O'Shanter, the poem, because having officiated at Burns Night Dinners over the years, I have never been in a state in which I was able to understand one word of what I was. <laughs> he seemed to speak in a Scots accent. Hoops, and uh, Tony Hawks is um, repetition of Scots. You said Scots you, in your in the first, first when first you were speaking right. previously. You did say Scots. So Tony, a correct challenge, a point to you. And there are four seconds left on Tam O'Shanter starting now. I saw a very nice Tam O'Shanter worn in a fringe show called Kilts Akimbo. <laughs> So Tony Hawkes was then speaking as the whistle went, and whoever is doing that gets an extra point. So he's now in the lead. Tony, would you like to take the second round? We've got a lovely subject here. Extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> Will you tell us something about it in this game? 60 seconds, starting now. I cannot understand this at all. Extra virgin olive oil. Surely this is a slur on the virility of Popeye. <laughs> Does this make Sweet Pea the new messiah? <laughs> These questions need to be answered for me. Now, olive oil, I like to put it on my dressings and my salads, obviously. It's high in mono... Um... Derek Nimmo's challenge. You can't put olive oil on your dressing, you can put it in your dressing. I think you're right, yes. yes. Uh, you, you can do it, it's just stupid. Yes. <laughs> I think within the rules of the game, Derry, we give the benefit of the doubt to you. You take over the subject, another point to you, and there are 30 seconds left, extra virgin olive oil starting now. I don't quite see how somebody can be extra virgin. If you're Virgo intact, that is sufficient. That is a totally sublime state. But to be extra virgin seems an absolute nonsense. But that particular kind of oil I myself use in a dressing with balsamic vinegar... <laughs> and... <laughs> Much Paul Merton, your challenge. We went into Welsh, I think. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we certainly hesitated. Paul, you have the subject, and you have 13 seconds on extra virgin olive oil starting now. Whenever I go shopping down at my local supermarket, I always buy extra virgin olive oil whether I need it or not. Consequently, I have 17 bottles at home, <laughs> and I just don't know what to do with them. Sometimes I decide... <laughs> Martin was then speaking as the whistle went, gained the extra point for doing so, and we're moving to the third round. Derek Nimmo, would you take the shipping forecast? Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? The shipping forecast, that is something one listens to, or at least it floats past one's ears, day in, very often, day out as well. Oh, Tony Evox really? challenge first. Uh, repetition of day. Yes, absolutely, absolutely right. Absolutely. <laughs> well listened. <laughs> Tony! The shipping forecast, and there are 52 seconds left, starting now. Dogger, Cromarty, Finisterre, <laughs> Bear, Cannon, all words that you hear on the shipping forecast, and they mean nothing to you at all. The most annoying thing I found about this broadcast is that one can be listening to a radio show that one is enjoying thoroughly, and then, at the end of it, one is subjected 
Derek Nimmer. One on one. Mm. There are two ones, yes. yes. Shipping forecast is back with you, Derek, and there are 33 seconds left starting north at Sierra and south ditto. Those are two <laughs> more annoying places that they have on the shipping forecast. I imagine little taller men outside Hull or Grimsby sitting in their boats waiting for the shipping forecast to come on. It must be the highlight of their day because they know they won't drown if they hear it and take the right kind of precautions. Pull in their nets to go a vast and away and they say back to their home port, to Donald's Way or Ronald's Way or all these other places like... Uh, and Cameron to try to challenge you. Oh, yes. there were a couple of Ronald's Way. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's only one Ronald's Way. He, he didn't repeat Ronald's Way. It sounded like it. He said something else. Donald's which was way. Donald's Way, which is actually is not... <laughs> in that case, if you said Donald's Way is deviation. I know, it's Ronald's amazing. Way. I was about to say, you would have had him for deviation on Donald's Way, because it's not part of the shipping forecast, but you had him first for repetition, so I think it's only fair to uh, give Derek a point and leave the shipping forecast with him, with six seconds to go, starting now. I turn on the knob, um, I find... Clement Freud. Deviation of Donald's Way. <laughs> You can't have retrospective challenge. <laughs> well, there's nothing there's in the no rules that says you can't, and I think it was rather clever of him, so I think I'm going to give it to him. So, Clement, there are five seconds for you to tell us something about the shipping forecast starting now. I'm always very interested to know how things are in Lundy, because hardly anyone lives there. <laughs> Roy, speaking as a whistle wind, gained that extra point. He's now in second place with Tony Hawks. Paul, it is your turn to begin. The subject, telepathy. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? <laughs> uh, a bonus point to Paul Merton for his telepathy. <laughs> And, um, but what were the messages you were getting before I take Derek's challenge? Well, I think everybody else picked it up. <laughs> Nicholas, though, is clearly a repetition of... Yeah. <laughs> that was the Another floor bonus the point point. to Tony Hawkes, but let's take Derek... You challenge first, Derek. What was your challenge? You haven't got one. <laughs> Total silence. Well, if you well, can't uh, have a within, total silence within, within the, rules, the rules of the game, yeah. within the rules of the game, you can't have a total silence. Yeah, within the well, rules that's a of new the challenge. Game. Maybe I'll allow that one. I didn't hesitate. So I didn't repeat. I didn't deviate. I did nothing. <laughs> and we interpret that as hesitation. So Derek, well, you... it's only hesitation if you then start. <laughs> If we pursue this argument, it's going to become so, so semantic, we're never going to get anywhere, and the show will never progress. So I'm going to give Derek a point for a correct challenge, and he has 48 seconds on telepathy, starting now. The word telepathy was coined in the last century by Mr. Miles, and it actually means to be able to communicate with another person through a non normal method of... Uh, Paul Merton challenge. A uh, sort of uh, hesitation there. A sort of hesitation which I will grant and you have 37 seconds to tell us something, we hope tell us something, <laughs> about <laughs> telepathy starting now. The Russians have always been very keen on telepathy. At one point they saw it as a secret weapon they could use against the West so they had several people locked away in laboratories trying to communicate to each other via brick walls and that kind of thing. I can't see how useful it can really be because if you can... <laughs> Derek Nimmo challenge. How do you communicate via a brick wall? Did you say via a brick wall? You did say via. Well, you shout it. for it then. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no, you, if they, if they, they you, or someone's got a window open. You could bounce <laughs> off it. If it's telepathetic, it would be coming through it. He wasn't using it as a, um, a sort of monitor in any way. I think it should have been through. <laughs> Were you there? <laughs> No, I wasn't, but I'm... It was actually the Russian via brick wall telephonic <laughs> communication symposium of 1948. Oh, I... If they get it wrong, that's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> I have to give the benefit of the doubt to Derek Nimmo, who has the subject with 21 seconds, starting now. I find after 39 years and nine months of marriage that I can communicate with my wife at an extraordinary... Uh, Tony Hawk, child. I think you said communicate in your first... Uh... You did say communicate yeah. before in this round. So, yeah. Tony, <laughs> correct challenge, 14 seconds, telepathy starting now. I am telepathic. For instance, I know now that I'm going to be buzzed. 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 <laughs> I, re 
Bonus Kenneth my Floyd case. came out and yeah. helped you out. But at least give him a bonus point because that was a clever idea. Clement, you have another point for correct challenge. You take the subject and uh, our ten seconds telepathy starting now. Another clever point which hasn't been used before, <laughs> which would be instrumental in getting me an extra point, would be to vomit. <laughs> It's not very good radio, actually. <laughs> it's not very good television. <laughs> no. Not very good being sat next to him, right? <laughs> but Paul Merton was the first to challenge. It's repetition of point. Yes, that's right. So, <laughs> Paul, you've cleverly got it. It's three seconds to go on telepathy starting now. One of the most wonderful things that I ever personally witnessed... <laughs> uh, Clement Freud challenge. He said things before. <laughs> So, Clement, you cleverly got in with half a second to go on telepathy starting now. Yes. <laughs> so, at the end of that round, which we've had everything including vomit, um, <laughs> uh, I <laughs> say that Tony Hawkes is now in the lead, just one ahead of Clement Freud, Paul Merton and Derek Nimmo. And, Clement, it's back with you to begin. The subject is wind power. Talk on the subject, please, starting now. Wind power is an anagram of down wiper, which is pretty interesting. It is also, of course, wind power, a political party, the great strength of which is that if someone comes to your door on behalf of wind power, you know instantly by the smell what it is going to be. You know a conservative, a socialist... Uh, Tony Hawke's challenge. I think repetition of no. He did say no, oh. yes. Tony, <laughs> the subject, 39 seconds are left. Wind power starting now. Wind power is supposed to be a very environmentally friendly form of generating power. However, it does make quite a lot of noise. I know people that have these things on their hills nearby their houses object to a whining noise which develops... <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of noise. There was too much noise, I'm afraid, Tony, yes. And you have wind power back with you, Clement, and 24 seconds left starting now. If you drive south along the 101, just before you... <laughs> Derek Nimmer. <laughs> 101. <laughs> One. <laughs> of all the roads you could have chosen, that was the one. <laughs> Where the windmills are. Ah. Oh. 21 seconds are left for you, Derek, on wind power, starting now. In the 19th century, on the music hall stage in Paris, there was a perdedista, and he was able, by using one of his lower orifices, to blow out a candle at a distance of two metres. He used to lean forward on the stage, remove the piece of clothing around this particular hole, and actually emit noises and wind power. Derek Nimmer was speaking, got the extra point. Only one point separates them all. Tony, will you take the next round? The subject, bills. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? It is a source of some disappointment to me that bills is so much more impressive than mine. I wouldn't mind <laughs> if he kept quiet about it, but he rings me up and harps on about it all the time, saying, Tony, my one is terrific. His phone bill, of course, arrives on oh, the... Oh, Derek Nimmer, you challenged. There was no sound, but your light came on. Well, I challenged quite a long time back because he <laughs> waited for a laugh, which you're mm. not allowed to do, mm. instead of keeping on talking. And so Did you say I'm a trained He's comedian? A tremendous... <laughs> <laughs> I get thrown out of the comic union if I talk over yeah. a laugh. <laughs> He's riding the laugh. Yeah, That's right. well, we, we, we used to try and ride the laugh. And I know with the fringe audience, of course, it's able to ride them because they're so vociferous. But, Derek, you were correct. 38 seconds <laughs> left. <laughs> on bills, starting now. When a ship set forth <sighs> on... Tony Challenge. He hasn't got any laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> Go rub it in. Sorry. <laughs> Derek, you have 36 seconds on bills starting now. The master keeps a copy of the bill of lading. One is given to the merchant, and another one is kept behind in the dockyard. And the thing, when you arrive in a port and you're... <laughs> st What's um, the Paul Merton I'm just building up to my last. I know. I know. <laughs> Repetition of port, I think. Yeah, I think we Not had a port. this time. Yes. Yes, you had port before. <laughs>
Paul, 25 seconds on bills starting now. I get bills all the time. I don't know why. It's nothing to do with me. They pop through the letter box. I open them up. Oh, dear, there's another 885 quid I've got to spend on something or other, which I've already had anyway, and I don't remember dabbing it in the first place. That's free. I don't care, because I'm very annoyed about it. <laughs> Telephone bill, there's one. £65 pounds the other day. That's um, £5 um, pounds again. The Clement Freud challenge. Well, it's all rubbish. <laughs> It may be rubbish, quick, but there's, there's no rule in just a minute. Well, there was you a repetition of one. Thing. Yes, there was, and pounds and a number of mm -hmm. other things, yes, right. <laughs> Eleven seconds, uh, Clement, on Bill, starting now. The Kings William the First, Second, Third and Fourth are colloquially known as the Royal Bills, and many people will tell you their dates, both of succession and the years in the... So Clement Freud has now taken the lead along with Derek Nimmer, one ahead of Tony Hawks and two ahead of Paul Merton. And Derek, your turn to begin. The subject is Great Walls. Will you talk about Great Walls starting now? Well, I suppose Max Wall must be one of the Great Walls. A wonderfully sublime comedian, dressed in black with floppy hair, extraordinary boots. He made me laugh probably more than anyone, except Tom Walls was a very funny man. Won the Derby with April the 5th, worked with Robinson Hare and other comedians, and the Great Wall of China. Wan Li is its known in Mandarin. One means 10,000. Um, it's only Hawks Challenge. Repetition of one. one yes, yes one. Well, one was one. Yeah. And and W-A-N. The other one was yeah. O-N-E. Yeah. <laughs> but they both sounded the same, so that's how yes, we sir. go in just a minute. 36 seconds are left for Great Walls with you, Tony, starting now. The greatest wall I have ever seen is a wall built by my neighbour, Mr Cooper, in my back garden. He climbed over in the night and started work on it against my... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Paul Merton. A repetition of my. Yes, yes. Right, 26 seconds, Paul, on Great Walls starting now. Oh, the Russians had the right idea, because in 1948 they tried to get this telepathic <laughs> experiment by a big wall. And the West were essentially amazed by this. This is an example of somebody who's continually talking, even though there is a laugh. It was one I could have rode, but in this occasion I decided to just keep going all the way through. And here's another one again. Okay? Now this is wild applause. Perhaps the greatest wall I've ever come across is the one that runs from Great Yarmouth all the way to Moscow. It's pleasant to know because most of it is under the water, and I'm very well aware that nobody's going to buzz me because they're going to see how long I can speak for without interrupting myself or hesitation or repetition or deviation. Meanwhile, the following week, I was still talking about this. <laughs> I think there's something about the way one brick goes on top of another one that I really enjoy. You know, you've got it in mortar down and you can build it as high as you like. There's a man in Halifax who's built a wall all the way up to the moon. The trouble is he can't use it because he can't find a stepladder long enough. <laughs> His next door neighbour, he's got the right idea. We have got another recording after this, have we? <laughs> So, Paul Merton was then speaking 30 seconds after the whistle should have gone. <laughs> and the rest. And, and he not only gets a point for not being interrupted, he gets a bonus point for continuing, and so he gets three points on that. It put him in the lead. He's one ahead of uh, Clement Freud and Tony Hawks. And they're all, all three are equal in second place. And one ahead is Paul Merton. And Paul, it's your turn to begin. <laughs> could, we ha could we have a drug test? <laughs> Right, Paul, your turn to be in. The subject is dates. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? April the 8th, March the 17th, <laughs> February the 29th. What do all these dates mean? Yes, they belong to the great British calendar year. I'm pleased that we can stand up with pride and patriotically say, January the 21st! <laughs> And be done with it. There's something about it. Why is it that we love our dates so much? I just people gather around on Christmas Day, December the 25th, exchange pleasantries. <sighs> um, Derek Nimmo Challenge. Uh, repetition of 20. Yes, you had 28 before, and now you've had the 25th. <laughs> it's true, don't look so <laughs> Just because you've managed to coax this audience into the... <laughs> Oh, no, he isn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Won them over. I've got to be fair with him just a minute. Derek's challenge was correct. 33 seconds, Derek, on dates, starting now. 
I suppose the most important date in British history, to me at any rate, is 1453, when we won the battle, or rather lost... Oh, uh, Paul Merton Challenge. Did you say bun the battle? Yes. <laughs> Was this the great bakery wars of the 15th century? <laughs> it, was, it was a bit of the telepathy was going through that war in Russia. It got diverted into bun, but it was deviation from English as we speak it usually. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, you have the subject of dates back. 26 seconds starting now. I remember from my history lessons at school the great BAP divide of the 16th century, <laughs> where these articles were fibula. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, you challenge first. I'm using some of my dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Repetition. We, hesitation. 19 seconds. Dates with you, Derek. Starting now. 1066, I suppose, changed. Clement Floyd challenge. 66. No. 60 and 6. Mm. Well, it's like 25 it's, and 28. It's... I mean, if you're going to yeah, give that... He had the word 20, he repeated. 66 is a 60 and a there 6. There are two sixes in it. If you write it down, but not if you speak it. I... Oh, God, they'll twist anything to try and get me in. Uh, there are 17 seconds left, uh, Derek. I disagree with the challenge. Dates are still with you starting now. William the Conqueror landed at Hastings and poor old King Harold copped it in the eye with an arrow. If you go to Bayeux, you can see the famous tapestry depicting this terribly tragic scene. But for England, it was a tremendous help. We were governed by the <laughs> Normans. Uh, Tony Hawk's a challenge. I've decided this is deviation. Yes, he's not he's really talking about He's no longer talking about dates. He's talking about the Battle of Hastings yes. and Bayeux tapestry. Right, so... <laughs> Tony, you've got in with three seconds to go on dates, starting now. The first date I ever went on was with a delightful young lady called Maria... <laughs> you know, never know what Maria and Tony did on their first date. Oh, I'll tell you if you like. <laughs> Maybe you should save it. Right. That's what I thought it's on the night. very, very... <laughs> Did it involve any deviation or repetition? <laughs> no, unfortunately, no repetition at all. <laughs> any hesitation? Oh, plenty of that. <laughs> Should make it the next subject. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it's still very close. Derek Nimmo's in the lead, one ahead of Paul Merton and Tony Hawkes, and Clement Freud is just behind them. Tony, your turn to begin. The subject, nursery rhymes. Will you tell us something about that subject starting now? I listened to a lot of nursery rhymes when I was little. The one that puzzled me the most was the one that started Wee Willy Winky. I wanted to know what would happen in this rhyme, but my mother would never tell me the end of it. London Bridge is Falling Down is another one which... This is just boring. <laughs> Clement, you challenge. It's just boring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So he hesitated and deviated. So, Clement, you have the subject. 44 seconds, nursery rhyme starting now. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The timepiece struck one, but the other two managed to get away. This is about as close as you can get to a nursery rhyme in just a minute, because on the whole, this type of verse is repetitive, devious, and pretty boring. <laughs> Politically, many of the nursery rhymes owe their existence to some sort of article or panache or weapon in which... <laughs> Don't know much of repetition of awe, or very, very slow indeed. Yes, he was uh, getting slower and slower. <laughs> Eleven seconds. Nursery rhymes with you, Derek, starting now. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. There came a big spider and sat down beside her, and she said, Piss off, hairy legs. That was the one that told me about my eight year old grandson. It's quite your thing. Derek Nimmo was speaking as the whistle went and has moved forward one ahead of our previous leader, Tony Hawkes. Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is Waterloo. Will you tell us something about Waterloo in this game starting now? Waterloo is, or the. Waterloo Cup. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Hesitation? I think it was hesitation, yes. Uh, there are 58 seconds on Waterloo with you, Paul, starting now. I remember once trying to cross the Sahara Desert. There was me and Lou. And he was desperate. He was thirsty. He, did, he wanted something to drink. And I turned to him and I thought, well, I'll have to water Lou because you're, you're the person that's carrying all the food supplies and I can't be bothered to take them all the way across the other side of this aforementioned place, which is, doesn't got much grass and so you could say is a kind of desert. <laughs> <laughs> Why did 
so bothered doing that. <laughs> right. The, the very word I tried to avoid, I then voluntarily said. I know, but you're revealing some of the stresses of just a minute to the audience. <laughs> right. 36 seconds are available for you, Derek, to take over. Waterloo starting now. The Waterloo Cup is where all the hottest dogs run. It is held outside Aintree. It was founded by Mr Lynn, who started also the Grand National, and it's early in February, and it is the premier event for course. And greyhounds will chase at the Waterloo Cup after one... Uh, Paul Merton Shunners. A repetition of cup. Yes, you had a cup before, I'm afraid. Derek, Paul, you've got Waterloo back, and you've got... I don't want it. <laughs> 18 seconds on Waterloo, starting now. One of the Kinks' best ever songs, I think, was Waterloo Sunset, a beautiful song written by Ray Davis, who at that time was the leader of the aforementioned group. And it's a beautiful... A Clement Floyd challenge. Repetition of aforementioned. Oh. Yes. <laughs> It's obvious you didn't want it. Yes. <laughs> Clement, you've got in Desert. on Waterloo. Eleven seconds are left starting now. I think one of the very saddest things about the Battle of Waterloo was that Kate Ady was not there. <laughs> but for her, it would have been an absolutely sensational. <laughs> Finishing on that high note, I now have to give you the final score because we have no more time to play in just a minute. It was a very close game. I'd hate to say there was a winner because I think they were all winners. But Paul Merton, <laughs> Tony I was, I was the least winner. <laughs> no. <laughs> Clement Freud, together equal with the least winners, they were two points behind Derek Nimmo, who we say for this edition was our winner. If you have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, it only remains for me to thank our four outstanding players of the game, and also Alison Harbert, who's kept the score and blown the whistle for us so magnificently, and also our producer, Anne Jobson, and of course particularly Ian Messeter, who thought of the game without whom we wouldn't still be playing it, and from me, Nicholas Parsons, until we take to the air once more and play Just a Minute from all of us. Goodbye. Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more, it is my pleasure to welcome the four exciting personalities who this week are going to play Just a Minute. We welcome back two of our oldest members of the team. It is Derek Nimmo and Peter Jones. <laughs> Old in the sense they played the game for 28 years. <laughs> and two of our younger players of the game who've only played it a few times. That is Tony Hawks and Jeremy Hardy. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> Beside me sits Liz Trott, who's going to keep the score and blow a whistle when 60 seconds is up. And once again, we are back in Cardiff. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Sherman Theatre before a very excited Welsh audience. <laughs> so I would like to say to this delightful Welsh audience we have here, Croeso and Shomai. <laughs> now, as usual, I'm going to ask our four panellists to speak on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject if they can. And, Tony Hawks, will you begin the show this week? The subject, Glamorgan. Will you tell us something about Glamorgan? 60 seconds, starting now. Glamorgan is a marvellous place, be it <laughs> Cardiff in South Glamorgan, Swansea in West Glamorgan, or Merthyr Tydfil in Mid Glamorgan. <laughs> the extraordinary thing is, though, there doesn't appear to be a North Glamorgan or an East Glamorgan. Perhaps these bits haven't been built yet. <laughs> when they are, I'm sure they will be equally delightful. <laughs> 
Carefilly is a lovely town, and whenever I go there, I like to write the words, please drive above the signpost, <laughs> causing great amusement amongst the passengers in my car. Clantwit Major, another super location. No relation to... Jeremy Hardy has challenged you. It's so ingratiating, it's revolting. <laughs> Yeah, but there's nothing in the rules of just a minute which says you can't ingratiate yourself with the audience, and I think he's doing a great job at that, actually, but... Uh, so it was an it's incorrect challenge. It's quite sick-making. Yeah. <laughs> but he's... But he's still playing just a minute, so... Jeremy, as that's an incorrect challenge, Tony Hawks gets a point, and he keeps the subject of Glamorgan, and there are 19 seconds left starting now. Glamorgan also has a cracking cricket team. <laughs> which I... Let us forget the one blur on their past when Malcolm Nash bowled to Gary Sobers <laughs> and he hit six sixes in one. Ah. Oh. Jeremy, no, yes? No, I'm wrong, because six and six is a different six. word. Yeah. You are wrong. Six sixes, yes. And Tony, another incorrect challenge, another point. Still with the subject, still ingratiating yourself. <laughs> Five seconds, Glamorgan, starting now. I am lost for words to describe... Uh, Peter Jones' challenge. If he's lost for words, he should stop. <laughs> I think he did hesitate after that, Peter, so... Yeah, thank you. you have got the subject. You have three seconds. A point, of course, for a correct challenge. The Morgan starting now. My daughter went to school in Lantwit Major, and I used to visit her... In just a minute, whoever is speaking, when the whistle goes, gains an extra point. It was Peter Jones. He has two points at the end of that round. He's equal with Tony Hawks. Jeremy Hardy, will you take the next round? The subject, mingling. Can you tell us something about mingling in just a minute? 60 seconds, starting now. At a party, one says, I must go and mingle when one is completely bored with the person. Uh, Peter Jones' challenge. Repetition of one. Yes, if you said one, you can't repeat it. So, Peter, you've got in on, uh, after five seconds, mingling, 55 seconds, starting now. Mingling was a giant panda who was brought <laughs> over here in order to impregnate the other panda <laughs> at London Zoo. <laughs> Unfortunately... Uh, no, you, excuse me, uh, uh, Peter, uh, Derek has challenged you. Well, repetition. You do need two pandas, I agree, <laughs> for that, but you did actually mention two. You said two pandas. One panda's brought in to impregnate another panda, you <laughs> Also, I'd just like to say, good evening, how are you? <laughs> so, Derek, a correct challenge, a point for that. And you take over the subject of mingling, 53 seconds, starting oh, now. Oh, gosh, Cardiff is a wonderful <laughs> place. I do like wandering around and seeing the jolly, smiling faces, passing Lord Mayors, and you say, what ho, and they wave back, and then you go on mingling around with even greater enthusiasm, particularly when you wander past Lord Bute's castle. And there are fair maidens with lustrous eyes, and you long to mingle with them, and they give you the most enchanting... Oh, I saw Tony Hawks. I was so carried away, I forgot to look at the, the lights there, Jason. <laughs> I was talking Nicholas. about these delicious Welsh maidens and I just went. I mean, I was gone. You see, Nicholas, Nicholas has now reached the age that when a girl says no, he's profoundly grateful. <laughs> Tony, you challenged. Well, I didn't really want to hear about him mingling with these Welsh lovelies, really, but uh, he well, did repeat a round. He did repeat a round. Earlier yes. on, but I let it go for a while. 25 seconds are left. Mingling starting now. Of course, as Jeremy was saying earlier in this round, it's most important to mingle when you are at a party. A good pickup line is, what is the capital of Poland? The person on the receiving end of this line will then say... Derek, two lines and Warsaw. <laughs> but Tony wasn't trying to get off with you or pick up. <laughs> Not as far as I know, unless there's <laughs> something going on between you, the panellists this week that I'm not you're aware You're no of. good at body language, are you, Nicholas? <laughs> Derek, you've got in of the correct challenge. 
Ten seconds on mingling starting now. If you go to a barn dance and strip the willow, that is an excellent way of mingling <laughs> with the local farmers who are sitting there on hired hay bales. <laughs> Right. Jerry you were speaking as a whistle when gained the extra point for doing so, and with other points in that round, you are now taking the lead just ahead of Peter Jones and Tony Hawkes, and then Jeremy Hardy and Derek. It's your turn to begin. Being taken for a ride. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? I think actually, being taken for a ride rarely means being made fun of, doesn't it, Russell? <laughs> sort of Though I suppose it can have rather sinister connotations. If you were in Las Vegas, for instance, at the Times or Bugsy Siegel, and you asked to take you for a ride, you could be taken out to the Nevada desert, shot through the head, and nobody would ever see you again. <laughs> that is one of the ways of being taken for a ride, which I would not really like very much. And I believe it's still goes on in various parts of the world, in Cambodia, for instance. Now, that is a country that... Uh, Tony Hawk's a challenge. Now, uh, we didn't hear any noise, but the light did come We on. had a Las Vegas, for instance, and then a Cambodia, for instance. Two for instances. Two for instances. Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely right. Well, listen. <laughs> so, Tony, you've got in with 29 seconds to go. The subject is being taken for a ride starting now. I love being taken for a ride on the donkey in Barry Island. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's a lovely little fellow. I jump up on there and I pat its hind quarters in an affectionate manner. Jeremy Hardy challenge. Sexual fantasy. <laughs> Who's yours or mine? <laughs> We enjoyed the challenge, so I'll give you a bonus point for that. But as it wasn't actually within the rules of just a minute, Tony gets a point for being interrupted. He keeps the subject being taken for a ride. 17 seconds, starting now. You can go to a car showroom and pretend to be really interested in purchasing a very expensive vehicle there. And then the salesman will tell you to jump in and he'll take you for a ride, not realising you're not remotely interested in <laughs> making a purchase. This is a good way of spending Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Tony Hawks, who points in that round, including one for speaking as the whistle went, has now taken the lead at the end of the round. And, Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. The subject, chips. Will you tell us something about those in this game, starting now? Not a very nourishing food, and I don't like chips that are made of bacon fat or even beef dripping. <laughs> but made with sunflower oil, they can be quite pleasant. Now, by a sheer coincidence... Derek Nimmo is telling me earlier about a friend of his who was in Hong Kong and where they have every kind of culinary experience available and he went on eating these chips at Harry Ramsden who apparently has a branch in uh, this aforementioned uh, oriental city. <laughs> and... <laughs> Wind it up? What? No, no, keep going. Keep oh, going. keep going, yes. Well... <laughs> Some people carry chips on their shoulders and they are really offering a challenge to anybody who likes to make some kind of insulting remark, in which case they'll probably hit out and, or make some... Uh, <laughs> Jeremy Hardy, you challenged. Oh, uh, I, I hesitation it was. Hesitation, yeah, yes, sorry. yes, Jeremy. So you've got him with seven seconds to go on chips starting now. I took some chips to a casino and one, a piece of cod and some saveloy. <laughs> I munched them with relish, <laughs> sitting by the roulette wheel while the croupier made his... <laughs> so at the end of that round, Tony Hawks is still in the lead. Uh, Tony, will you take the next round? It's your turn. The subject, gladiators. Will you tell us something about those creatures in this game, starting now. My favourite gladiators are the ones who appear on that popular LWT light entertainment <laughs> program, <laughs> such as Wolf, Steel, Lightning, and three others we don't normally hear of, Budgie, Librarian, and Yorkshire Terrier. 
They don't get on the show as much as the aforementioned characters. I would love to see them with their little muscles rippling as they attempt to scale a wall that no one would venture to attempt unless they were being paid by a TV company. <laughs> now, gladiators were also found in Roman times when they had to fight things like lions to amuse the emperors. Quite tough for them in many ways, but they would attempt this with such a... Jeremy Hardy. Wasn't it to attempt? There was to attempt. <clears throat> yes, Jeremy, well listened. Fifteen seconds are available for you to tell us something about gladiators starting now. As I remember from my Latin O-level, the bravest of all gladiators were the retiarii, who carried fishnets and tridents and were often hired by conservative MPs <laughs> to entertain at private social functions. These glistening, oil-covered young men were very popular <laughs> among peers of the realm. <laughs> I must say, some of the images you create, Jeremy, are quite tantalising. Uh... <laughs> Tony Hawks, you're still in the lead at the end of the round. Jeremy Hardy was speaking as whistle went game next to point. He's now moved into second place, equal with Derek Nimmo, but only one point behind is Peter Jones. Jeremy, it's your turn to begin. The subject, rainbow. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? The colours of the rainbow are violet, indigo, blue, brown, grey and tartan. <laughs> He never challenged. He said, wrong, you've deviated. It depends how much Benlin you've been taking. <laughs> yes, well, I think we have to say you were deviating there. 54 seconds for you, Derek, on Rainbow starting now. The best way to remember the colours of the rainbow are to say Richard of York gave battle in vain... Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, and indigo, violet. Tony Hawk's challenge. That's not the best way. <laughs> this for me. That's just a way. <laughs> yes, but you see, you can say it's the best way because it's probably the best way for Derek to do it. We'll give you a bonus point for that, Tony, but of course Derek gets a point for being interrupted. He keeps the subject. 43 seconds, Rainbow starting now. Many years ago, I used to work at Rainbow Corner, an establishment run by Charles Forty, as he then was. He hadn't been ennobled, which was a former Lions place just in Piccadilly Circus. And I used to serve there with Mr. Anton Rogers, who's gone on to have tremendous success. And we were behind the hamburger counter and a pretty mean burger we both made. <laughs> and when our penniless chums like Nicholas Parsons came in, Tony, he used to slip him. What? Yes, Tony Hawk's <laughs> challenge. He challenged you just be, before uh, I came in your hamburger joint. Yes, it seemed to be that much to do with rainbows anymore, isn't it? Oh, rainbow the, corner. Yes, but I, know, I mean, but you uh, really, I can have a pair of trousers called American Rainbow Regiment. talk about them. <laughs> You, you mentioned Rainbow Corner, but you've really gone off into the world of hamburgers and, uh, you know, well, your early struggles in show business. So I agree I with you. I don't your... know why anyone would want to remember all the colours of the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case one is asked what they are, <laughs> which the chances are remote. <laughs> of anybody doing that except on this footling game. <laughs> Tony, I agree with your challenge. 18 seconds are available for Rainbow starting now. Somewhere <laughs> over the rainbow, way up high. What a beautiful piece of music, and you don't even need to know the colours of the rainbow to sing it. I can't remember. Peter Jones, a challenge. You do need an ear for music. <laughs> Peter, we love that challenge. Shall we give you a bonus point for that? But he wasn't deviating within the rules of game. So, uh, Tony, you get another point because you were interrupted. You have five seconds on rainbow starting now. We're after the same rainbow's end. Waiting round. <laughs> so Tony's singing efforts kept him going. Till the whistle went, and he's gained extra points throughout the round. He's got a good lead now over Derek Nimmo, and they are followed equal place, Peter Jones and Jeremy Hardy. Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is Dawn Chorus. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? Because of insecticides, there are so few birds around. Yes. There. Jeremy Hardy. 
A hesitation over F there. Yes, yes. I thought you said in vasectocytes. I think I probably did, Ed. Yeah. All these birds who had vasectomies on this very <laughs> So, Jeremy, I agree with the challenge. It was deviation from English as we understand it. And um, uh, 57 seconds are available on Dawn Chorus starting now. Dawn Chorus is a lovely girl. Dawn Chorus by name, Dawn Chorus by nature, she says cheerfully as she wakes everybody up at five o'clock in the morning impersonating pigeons and cuckoos and other kinds of bird. The pterodactyl is believed to have been descended from the bird and that's why... Uh, <laughs> Derek Nimmo jumped. Too many birds. There were too many birds, yes. So, Derek, you've got the somebody back. There are 38 seconds for tell us more about Dawn Chorus starting In up. In central London, the Dawn Chorus has been replaced at dawn by the noise of aeroplanes approaching Heathrow. Great big air buses and tri-stars and jumbo debts begin at about six in the <laughs> Jeremy, morning. Jumbo debts, I think. Jumbo <laughs> <laughs> I think we're in the territory oh, well, that's, of... That's oh. why Freddie Laker went bankrupt. <laughs> so, back with you, Jeremy. 24 seconds on Dawn Chorus, starting now. My favourite bird is the... Kitty Peter Jones, a challenge. Uh, hesitation. Yes, maybe. before you quickly couldn't get the word bird out again. No, quickly. 21 seconds, Dawn Chorus, Peter, starting now. The Dawn Chorus that we get isn't all that pleasant because it's made up of pigeons and magpies, blue jays and rooks or crows and none of them make a very pleasant sound. Now, if we could get thrushes, nightingales even, or some bird with a voice... <laughs> Derek Nimmo chant. You can't get a nightingale for a dawn chorus. <laughs> well, I, I did say if. No, if. if. <laughs> he was, no, I, I think he was definitely into his own world of fantasy there, because that's what he liked in his dawn chorus. He didn't say that it is possible, but he just said he would like it, Derek. So I disagree, actually. Peter, an incorrect challenge, so you keep the subject. Three seconds are available, dawn chorus, starting now. And since we have the Royal Artillery next door, practically, we get a lot of... End of that round, Tony Hawks is still in the lead ahead of Derek Nimmo and then Jeremy Hardy and Peter Jones. Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject, leaks. Will you tell us something about that <laughs> in just a minute, starting now? Well, leaking is what a lot of nervous members of Parliament and other people <laughs> in politics use to get over information that they haven't got the guts to come out and say in a straightforward manner, either to the press, radio, media, anywhere. And I don't really think it's awfully nice, because they should be, have the courage to say what is going on. <laughs> Oh, you hung up or something. <laughs> yes, it did. What? We, we were enjoying it so much, and then you just stopped. Yes, I know. Well, I thought you were enjoying it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that you were laughing at me more than... Uh, <laughs> with me, you see. That's the trouble. Jeremy, you buzz first, and there uh, are 31 seconds on leaks starting now. Leaks are the national emblem of Wales, along with daffodils... Dragons and Max Boyce. <laughs> Max is not heard from much these days. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Max twice. Yes, fair Max. enough. Yes, fair Maximum. enough. You've repeated it, yes. 22 seconds available on Leaks, Derek, starting now. Leaks, indeed, yes. It is said that St David, no less, actually gave the order for the leaks to be put on the hats of the soldiers so that they could be differentiated from the Saxons who they were fighting at the time. And ever since then, a leak has been the emblem of this noble... <laughs> the Guards Regiment, which Carl so hails from this part of the world, they tend to put leaks... What's the matter with you? Tony Hawk. <laughs> I thought there were two put-them-ons. Yeah, you put them on, yes, you put them on the head and you put them on. Um, Tony, three seconds available on leaks starting now. Leaks are something that Jeremy and I are going to have to take very short. <laughs> 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 
Tony, well done. You kept going to the whistle wind, gained an extra point. You've increased your lead at the end of that round, and it is your turn to begin. The subject, extravaganza. Will you tell us about that marvellous subject starting now? Starlight Express, where you pay £20 for the privilege of watching actresses and actors roller skating around a stage pretending to be trains, is an example of an extravaganza. There is another word you could use to describe it. <laughs> However, that is the one favoured by Mr Lloyd Webber himself. Nick... Jerry Nimmo challenge. Well, I, he missed out his night, or that's all, I think. <laughs> and I think Sir Andrew would not like that. <laughs> it's no it good does... creeping to him, he doesn't give them out. <laughs> Tony, there are 38 seconds for you to continue with extravaganza, starting now. Nicholas Parsons himself starred in an extravaganza. The Rocky Horror Show, where the characters cross-dressed and had overt sexuality. Why they thought of having Nicholas Parsons in this role, I cannot fathom. Derek Nemo Challenge. Repetition of Nicholas Parsons. I don't think you can have too much of that. Twenty-five seconds for you, Derek, on extravaganza starting now. Oh, my goodness, Nicholas Parsons is himself an extravaganza. If you'd seen him there in his high heels and his fist-fed stockings, it was the most wondrous sight to behold. An audience every night was totally captivated by this elderly gentleman standing in the corner, flashing his lovely knees. I suppose one could almost say... That the, an extravaganza. Oh. Peter Jones, a challenge. A bit of a stumble there, wasn't yeah, I there? Know. Was. I know. He suddenly changed the subject from Nicholas Parsons. He stumbled. <laughs> there we are. But Peter, you cleverly got in with only half a second ago <laughs> on extravaganza starting now. Hardly worth saying anything. <laughs> So Peter Jones is equal with Jeremy Hardy in third place. A second place is Derek Nimmo. Tony Hawkes is still in the lead. Jeremy, your turn to begin. The subject, hibernating. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Every year, my trusted tortoise, Tommy, holds up for the winter. It sets in a store of acorns and hazelnuts, tinned goods, frozen food, and other non-perishables to last throughout the winter months. When after that time, it metamorphoses into a butterfly. A beautiful beast the size of a small man, myself or Ronnie Corbett, for example. Hibernating is also popular among politicians who are about to face a scandal. They will disappear on holiday or be unavailable for comment, visiting some spurious foreign dignitary. Oh, God. <laughs> Derek, you challenged. Well, he stopped and said, he oh, stopped, God, yes. I mean... Uh, uh, <laughs> hesitation, we call that. 22 seconds are available. You tell us something about hibernating starting now. I think there's a certain attraction to hibernating. Now, in the wintertime, November perhaps, one would awfully like to be able to curl up into a warm ball with an electric blanket and a Nebuchadnezzar of champagne handy adjacent <laughs> and just tidy oneself away until the first warm winds of spring come round the corner. Jerry got points in the round, including one for speaking as the whistle went, and he's moving up on our leader, Tony Hawkes. And we move into the final round, so Derek, it's your turn. A subject, choir. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? Well, a Welsh voice choir. There is no a more magnificent sound, <laughs> particularly if it is a male choir, which I think thrills the voices that sing the noises that make the choir. <laughs> and also, because I'm beginning oh, to talk a bit about something. Yeah, yes, your, your, your rubbish was interrupted. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes. Well, he was talking absolute rubbish. I know. Yeah. 46 seconds are available for you, uh, Tony, on choir, starting now. We're walking in the air. <laughs> Sang Alid Jones, the well-known choir boy. He had another hit with P.A. 
amazing. But then, unfortunately, two things dropped and he didn't have any more success. <laughs> I was missing that greatly because I was a huge fan of him. His ability to hit the top notes, A sharp, and onwards to the B, was a huge joy. Uh, Derek Nimochalic. A sharp, and then re repeat yes, as A. Yes, A, emphasise the A. And so Derek got in with 16 seconds to go. The subject is still choir, Derek, starting now. Well, I Alan Jones was a very lucky choir boy because in earlier times he might have joined the castrati, which they used to actually castrate the young men so they could retain their soprano and alto voices. And very unpleasant it must have been for them for the rest of their lives, which would be rather negative, to say the least. Some of the choirs are one here... <laughs> So Derry got the subject back, kept going to the whistle when gained that all-important extra point, just a nudge ahead of Tony Hawkes. Peter Jones and Jeremy Hardy finished equal in third place. Tony Hawkes was only two points behind Derek Nimmo, but we say Derek is the winner this week. <laughs> Our delightful audience here in the Sherman Theatre and the Mayor for gracing us with his presence. Also to thank our four panellists for their great contribution to the show and also Liz Trott for keeping the score and blowing her whistle so magnificently, for Ian Messeter for thinking up the game so we keep in work, for Anne Jobson for her sterling work as our producer and from them and from me it is goodbye from this edition of Just a Minute and to all our Welsh listeners, yucky da! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away once more, it is my pleasure to introduce the four exciting and devastating personality. So this week, I'm going to play Just a Minute. We welcome back Clement Freud, Tony Hawkes, and two who've only played it once before, Kit Hesketh Harvey and Hugh Dennis. Will you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> Beside me sits Miriam Jones with a stopwatch, and she's going to keep the score and blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And this particular show is coming from the Ladder Market Theatre. In the centre of that lovely city of Norwich, and as usual, I will ask our contestants to speak on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. We'll begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, can you tell us something about jesters? There are 60 seconds, as always, starting now. Noel Coward had a poem which went, Saturday last by way of contrast, we went to a marvellous party. I must say the fun was intense. We all had to wear the sort of clothes we should wear in a hundred years hence. Kit Hesketh, Harvey, you challenge. We all had to do what the people we knew would be doing a hundred years hence, isn't it? Different poem. Oh, it was a different one. <laughs> 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 I don't know, actually, I, I thought there was a representation of where, wasn't there? There was, was a, no. I, yes, there was definitely a representation of where. You definitely repeated where, Clement. Um, so, uh, Kit, <laughs> you have got in with 47 seconds to go. You get a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject, and it is just as starting now. Dear Cecil arrived wearing armour, some shells and a black feather boa. Poor Millicent wore a surrealist comb made of bits of mosaic from St Peter's in Rome. But... Clement Freud challenge. Deviation has nothing to do with jesters. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think you're getting up rather far off the subject. Of you're both showing off, in other words. I mean, that's, that's all you're doing, right? So, Clement, it's nothing to do with jesters. You're right. A point to you, 37 seconds, jesters, starting now. They said, come, just as you are. Which is... <laughs> made of bits of mosaic from Peter's in Rome. The weight was so great that we had to go home. We couldn't have enjoyed it more. Um, Jesters is the name... Hugh Dennis Charles. He said, mmm, I think. I mm. know he did, but, I mean, he didn't exactly pause. I would have no, thought, no. 
Mm. Was a hesitant. <laughs> no, I, I think he was keeping going mm. with a certain amount of style. No. I'm with you, Clement, on this one. I give you the benefit of the doubt. 22 seconds, an incorrect challenge. Jester's starting now. Jester's the name of a quite excellent amateur theatre company in Ealing in which many actors had their starts. I would like to give you the names of some of these thespians, <laughs> beginning with Alfred, Bernard, Charles, David Edward, Francis, Graham... Harry, Ivor, Jack. <laughs> and... Uh, <it's> only... <laughs> I think he hesitated. Though. He definitely hesitated before Jack, yes, definitely. And you very cleverly got in with half a second to go, Tony, <laughs> on Jester's starting now. Standing a long way... <laughs> <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Tony Hawk. So, Tony, you have two points, and so does Clement Freud. You're both in the lead there together. Kit Hesketh Harvey, your turn to begin. The subject is haunting. Can you tell us something about haunting in this game starting now? No doubt this charming little theatre here in the fine city of Norwich is terribly haunted, but my first acquaintance with an apparition... Tony Hawk's challenge. So I'm just challenging him for an appalling Norfolk accent. <laughs> <laughs> Deviation from speaking proper. <laughs> Kit, you keep the subject mm. and you have a point, of course, for being interrupted. And there are 53 seconds on haunting starting now. The 12th century refectory that was the dormitory of my preparatory school was haunted by the shade of one Nell Cook of the Inglesby Legends of Canterbury. This unhappy domestic was in employ to a canon of that minster of that bleak eastern coast, and so possessed was she by violent love for him that when he invited a fair and comely maid to dine tete at the <laughs> theatre... <laughs> Clever, uh, hesitation. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I it was know. Going to be a repetition. I was going to say. No, but tete a tete's hyphenated. You could have carried on with that. Clement, <laughs> <laughs> a correct challenge for hesitation. Twenty-one seconds for you on haunting starting now. In my part of Suffolk, which is south of Lowestoft and north of Alderborough, we have a ghost in the village of Walberswick who lives in a house called Dun Haunting, <laughs> and I think this is an extremely good name for a residence. Any spirit, hobgoblin, or other manifestation from outer space would be... <laughs> so, Clement Roy kept going to the whistle when gained an extra point for doing so, and he's in the lead at the end of that round. Tony Hawks, will you take the next round? The subject is deal. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Deal is a place in Kent, which bears no resemblance to Norwich and is not as nice as that place. It had... Hugh Dennis Challenge. Yeah, place and place. Yes, sir. Mm. Oh, God, I only got about Maybe one seconds. was the fish, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, 52 I, seconds yeah. for you, uh, Hugh, on Deal starting now. Deal is indeed a very small town in Kent, hence the phrase, it's no big deal. <laughs> I have never visited it and have no real intention of doing... Tony Hawk's Challenge. I'm sorry, I think he might have repeated deal, but... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, real. He did repeat real. He did yes. repeat real. Well, yeah. listen, oh, Tony, well, 43 seconds for you on deal starting now. High-powered businessmen pride themselves on clinching a deal. I am not particularly good at making deals. When someone sells me something for £40, I like to say, £50 for cash, just to confuse them. <laughs> it is a great pleasure I take in doing this kind of deal. Another kind of deal you can do... Kit, well, there are two kind of deals. Are you like kind of deals? No, you, you, you're a repetition of kind, yes. So, but you have a correct chance. Oh, a few, sorry. You're looking at me so severe. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, I was concentrating, that was all. Um, 22 seconds for you on deal, Kit, starting now. The brawny arms of cooks in days of yore used to scrub every morning the deal tables that adorned their empires and upon which were ranged pottery and crockery and cutlery and other artefacts of their experience. What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Tony 
Tony Hawks, will you tell him? Uh, yeah, he's ground to a halt there. <laughs> yes, 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 hesitation, yes. Tony, there are eight seconds for you to tell us something about deals starting now. Dirty deals are the kind of deals to die. Tim and Freud challenge. We've had a kind. Yeah, yes, yeah, you've had a kind. So that was just hopeless all round, wasn't it? <laughs> Clement, you've got him a six seconds to go on deal starting now. In six seconds, the kind of thing I could say is that a real deal is a small town in Kent. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. You, uh, you challenge. You challenged before the whistle went. What was it? Oh, I thought it was a hesitation. It definitely was a hesitation. <laughs> You've got one second to tell us something about deal, uh, Hugh, starting now. Deal! <laughs> <laughs> Definite hesitation. Right. Hesitation. Tony Hawks, yes, half a second on deal, starting now. The last thing I... Yes, no, it weighed. No, Tony Hawks. <laughs> So at the end of that round, Tony's now in the lead, and Hugh, it's your turn to begin. Subject is Norfolk Broads. <laughs> 60 seconds, starting now. There are two types of Norfolk Broads. <laughs> Firstly, there is the area famous for sailing to the north of Norwich, and on the other hand, the term Norfolk Broads might be taken to mean girls from this fair county. So imagine my excitement when, at the age of 12, my mother said we were going on holiday to see the Norfolk Broads. <laughs> And imagine my disappointment when I discovered that they were just waterways. Still, it didn't matter. I snogged one of them. <laughs> Clement Freud challenged. <laughs> Stopped. He stopped. I know. He was, was, so, he, he was so enjoying the audience reaction, you know. No, I a was true deep. comic, he couldn't get away from it. He was... I was deep in memory, actually. Oh, I... <laughs> Clement, you've got him at 30 seconds on Norfolk Broads, starting now. In the 1930s, May West very nearly became a Norfolk Broad, and it happened in the following way. The Duke of Norfolk went to Hollywood, and the aforementioned actress, very keen to become a duchess, sent him a case of champagne, which His Grace returned. So she had delivered a dozen red roses, which also came back. Cigars, Havanas, arrived... And the Duke sent them back with the words, <laughs> Dear Miss West. Repetition of Duke, I think. Yes, and also Duke. sent back. But what, what, what's the payoff? Because <laughs> only three seconds to go, and I think he's got in. OK, he wrote and said, Dear Miss West, I neither like flowers, nor smoke, nor drink Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> You've got him in three seconds to go, Hugh, on Norfolk Broads, starting now. It is no fun getting a mouthful of water, I can tell you. <laughs> End of that round, Tony Hawks and Clement Freud are equal in the lead. And Clement, it's your turn to begin again. The subject is demons. Will you tell us something about demons in this game, uh, starting now? Demons are very seldom to be found in Norwich. Tunbridge Wells, Market Harborough, Great Yarmouth, Lowestoft. Um, <laughs> Sorry, yes, I think he hesitated before, he, before uh, Lowestoft. Yes, he brought it back up to Norfolk and then he hesitated. Right, Tony Hawks, 52 seconds on demons starting now. The true definition of a demon, to my mind, would be someone who would attempt to snog a Norfolk brawl. <laughs> this would be an evil act. The innocent lake just sitting there, not expecting someone to dash down with their tongue and start wiggling about over the surface. That's no way to behave. Demonic, in my opinion. Demonic, <laughs> oh, is something I've just repeated. <laughs> Kit, so you got in first there. I, I, yes, it was yeah. too demonic. There were it indeed. Was very, it was very funny. 31 demons. seconds for you to tell us something about demons starting now. The demon drink, of course, is that which haunts most of us and most terrifyingly <laughs> so. Clement <laughs> Freud got in. Two most. Two most. Clement, 27 seconds for you on demons starting now. There used to be a game called Racing Demons, which was enormously popular. When I say it was once, so... <laughs> <laughs> Tony Hawk's got in. Yes, I think he hesitated Yes, again, he did. Though. 20 seconds for you, Tony. Demons starting now. Sweeney Todd, the demon of Fleet Street, well known for luring people into his barber's shop and cutting their necks to pieces. An extraordinary act in my humble view. But let me tell you some more about demons, because I am delighted to be talking. <laughs> 
Tony, you kept going to the whistle when gained an extra point for doing so, and you've taken the lead at the end of that round. Kit Hesketh Harvey, your turn to begin. The subject kit is the Jurassic Years. When you talk on the subject, 60 seconds as usual, starting now. The Jurassic years followed the Triassic period and laid down in these aisles a belt of limestone which ranged from Whitby and Robin Hood's Bay down through Milton Mowbray, Cheltenham, Stroud, Evesham and Yeovil until <laughs> at Lyme Regis it ended where upon one afternoon a local girl was walking, tripping happily through through the cliffs of Charmouth, when she chanced upon the protruding corpse of an ichthysaurus, sister beast to the Diana Sordapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotapotap
24 seconds for you, Huon. Checks starting now. Checks are the pattern that Rupert Bear wears on his trousers, <laughs> which is slightly strange, I always think. Why would a bear... Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Clement Freud challenge. Two bears. Two bears, yes. Mm -hmm. 16 seconds. Checks. Clement starting now. I'm very fond of checks and tried to get as my racing colours of horses that compete against others over the sticks and on the flat to wear black and white gingham check and the jockey club refused to allow this. <laughs> Clement Roy was again speaking as the whistle went and gained an extra point for doing so and Clement, it is your turn to begin. The subject is how to make a shoe. Can you tell us something <laughs> about that subject? And there are 60 seconds starting now. I do think this is the most appallingly stupid subject I've ever been given. <laughs> if I had any idea of how to make a shoe, I would be a cobbler and would not be sitting in a theatre in Norwich trying to earn a living from Radio 4 BBC, <laughs> who's... Kit, where are you trying to be? BBC. <laughs> 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 well, listen, I've no doubt this subject's been chosen because Norwich is, of course, the centre of shoemaking. You mean it's also shaking? where the I quiz of the week Hampton comes from. Was. North <laughs> Hampton is associated with shoes, but, but Norwich is accepted now as the European centre of shoemaking. I'm sure you'd endorse that, wouldn't you, audience? <laughs> <laughs> Who's here from Northampton? <laughs> <laughs> Kit, repetition of B, a uh, point to you, 44 <laughs> seconds. How to make a shoe starting now. Of all the pastries that a patisserie chef is required to do, shoe pastry is generally... Oh, no. oh, Clement Freud challenge. <laughs> pastry. Too much pastry, yes. 38 <laughs> seconds, Clement. How to make a shoe, starting now. In a casino, a shoe is the holder of packs of cards. And if you play Chemin de Fer or Baccarat, the... <laughs> Tony Hawk's challenge. Uh, this is not how to make a shoe, is it? Yes, absolutely. Oh, it is, is it? Before you... <laughs> <laughs> You make a shoe by shuffling cards and putting them into it. And that ah, is called right. making a shoe. Well, All right, of course, I, 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 I stand... I sit correct. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Clement, you have another point. 30 seconds on how to make a shoe starting now. You would be well advised to go to Norwich, which is the shoe centre of Europe. <laughs> the most famous shoe town anywhere. There are folk who thought that Northampton <laughs> had some sort of claim to the manufacture of footwear. They are mistaken, <laughs> wrong, absolutely fallacious. <laughs> East Anglia is the centre of this. Tony Hawk's a challenge. A uh, repetition of centre. Yes, you had the centre before, <laughs> Clement, I'm afraid, yes. Six seconds for you, Tony, on how to make a shoe starting now. There is no point in making a shoe. You need to know how to make two shoes. <laughs> Well, Tony Hawks, a lovely line, and as the whistle went, got another point. Kit, it's your turn to begin. The subject is demonstrations. Can you talk on the subject starting now? That volatile and telegenic chef, Valentina Harris, who is a Norfolk neighbour of mine, quite frequently and generously gives me demonstrations of her culinary skills, which are legion. And in particular, she demonstrates to me how to make Tuscan minestrone soup, that magnificent dish which sends so many of her countrymen singing out into the olive groves and the vineyards of their native Umbria. <laughs> so they move from Tuscany to Umbria. In, in a he just said what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he hesitated. He did hesitate, yes. Tony, 32 seconds on demonstration starting now. If you go onto the streets of the cities of Europe, you can very often see political demonstrations. They are frightening affairs. Sometimes people will sit in front of traffic which is a foolish move in my opinion, but they will do it to demonstrate a case which they have against the government of their country. I am proud to watch these bastions of truth who fight injustice wherever they see it. Let them go forward, I proudly say, as I beat my chest in support of their... <laughs> So Tony Hawks not only kept going on the subject, he spoke as a whistle when gained an extra point, and he's taking the lead now, one ahead of Clement Freud. And Tony, it's also your turn to begin. The subject is my memory. 
Can you tell us something about that? Which is rather useful in this game, starting now. My memory is considerably better than Nicholas Parsons, but that is another point. The point I far... <laughs> <laughs> well, may you fluff on that yeah. one. So, Clement, you got in with 53 seconds to go on my memory, starting now. My very first memory was going to the Anchor Inn in Walberswick, which is south of Lowestoft and <laughs> north of Alderborough in the county of Suffolk. A man called Ginger Winyard was behind the... Tony Hawk's challenge. Uh, deviation. He's not talking about his memory. He's talking about a memory he had. Oh, that's a difficult one, because, oh. I mean, yes, yes. Well, I, mean, I think we put it A to memory is my... part of my memory. Well, he was going to go on about Norfolk and uh, that, so maybe the audience wanted to hear it, did they? No, <laughs> I, I think I have to give him the benefit of the doubt, because a memory is part of my memory, and so, Clement, you still have the subject. Another point, of course, 39 seconds, my memory is starting now. My memory is pretty well known among my family. Sons, daughters, cousins, nieces, nephews, uncles and aunts say Clement Freud's memory is terrific. They say, throw it up in the air, catch it. It's there. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> you this challenge. I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> well, he did uh, hesitate. No, I thought he was going to hesitate, well, but he did I don't think he did. Unless you're the first person I'd like to see both sides of a case. And Messi, you're the first person. Mm -hmm. The first... He was going to hesitate, yeah. but then he didn't. It was a sort of mmm sort of noise. Well, it's the and first time uh, we've had a, a person in the show, actually, who, when I've given it to them and said he did hesitate, and you said, no, I don't well, think... Well, no, I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't want to win by cheating. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any I'd question rather... of you winning here. <laughs> So That's even though I agree hurt. with the challenge of hesitating, you don't want it? I, no, I, I, I'd rather not. Right. <laughs> So, Clement, you have another point of 23 seconds on my memory starting now. The first county cricket match, which is in my memory, was at Lord's in St John's Wood in London. Hutton and Washbrook opened the bat. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Hawks, uh, Hesitation. Yes, because yes. that uh, um, was a stumble. So we call that hesitation. 14 seconds. My memory, Tony, starting now. Memories, in fact, light the corners of my mind. Misty, warty colour memory. <laughs> 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 it's perfectly possible they might be warty, I don't think, but I think he meant water, didn't he? I think it's, so, I think it was deviation. Warty coloured memories, I think. Yeah, well, they were <laughs> warty coloured. <laughs> Kit, we give it to you, nine seconds on my memory starting now. Whereas Tony Hawkes' memories are a dull and scabrous grey, mine are rose tinted with madder and other such lovely hues. Memories by <laughs> Sir Andrew Lu <laughs> Well, Kit was then speaking as a whistle went again. Next point for doing so. He's still in third place, just ahead of Hugh Dennis. And they are trailing Tony Hawkes and Clement Freud, just one point ahead in the lead. And Hugh, took your turn to begin. Hugh, the subject is keyholes. Can you tell us something about those in this game, starting now? I have recently removed all the keyholes from my house in the fear that Lloyd Grossman might come <laughs> round to slag off my home furnishings for his programme through the keyhole. If any cameraman attempts to stick his apparatus in my door locks, what he will see is lots of metal oil and the back of my door. In fact, the name of the programme, uh, Through the Keyhole, is rather misleading. <laughs> Tony Hawk's challenge. Uh, repetition of through. <laughs> yes, yes it was. But through, I, through I, I thought keyhole. perhaps if you put it in <laughs> inverted... No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get very cold yeah. when you go home tonight and yes. you can't get in your house. Incidentally, if you... <laughs> If you do have warty memories, you could have them frozen <laughs> off. <laughs> Possibly. Tony, no, you have a point. You have 38 seconds. Keyholes starting now. Keyholes don't actually exist. They aren't there. The bits round the outside of them do. People don't realise this. I do, and that's why I'm so sad. <laughs> <laughs> now... <laughs> You challenged. Uh, it was very funny again, but no, I'm afraid he, he, he just ground to a halt. Uh, well, no, he didn't ground to a halt. He was playing the laugh. I mean, he was, he was, uh, laugh himself. He was just enjoying himself. Yeah, he was but, like, but it was I, hesitation. Well, no, 24 was... seconds for you on keyholes. Uh, Kit starting now. Keyholes to me include ears, noses, and mouths, and of course, the last. Tony Hawk's challenge. He's just telling us that he's mad. <laughs> <laughs> 
we don't want to know what keyholes are to him. We want to know what keyholes are to all of us. And they're not ears. <laughs> if Deviation. you're sad, he can be mad, I say. <laughs> I would agree with you. I don't think he's sad or mad, but I don't think... I, there's no common sense in keyholes, big ears and all that. He's absolute rubbish. Um, so, 19 seconds for you, Tony, on keyholes starting now. They are very good to look through, but you must be very careful when you do, because there might be some on the other side with a water pistol who will squirt you with it, and then it will go in your eye. What a terrible thing to happen to you that would be. I'm sorry I'm once again addressing you like a group of children, but that's the way I do things. <laughs> Oh, well, Tony, you were speaking as the whistle went. <coughs> Get an extra point for doing so. And as you did that, you might be interested to know that you brought the show to an end. Because... <laughs> yeah. As a concept. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh finished in fourth place, just ahead of his kid, Hesketh Harvey, and then was Clement Freud. And he was two points behind Tony Hawks. So we say this week, Tony Hawks is our winner. <laughs> Enjoy this edition of Just a Minute. It only remains to say on behalf of Clement Freud, Tony Hawks, Keith Heskill Harvey, and Hugh Dennis, and of course our producer Sarah Smith and Miriam Jones, who's kept the scorn and the whistle for me, and also, of course, Ian Messeter, who thought of the game and therefore keeps us all in work, and for me, Nicholas Parsons. We hope you've enjoyed it all. We have, and until we all meet again playing Just a Minute through the airwaves, goodbye! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome the four exciting panellists who are going to play the game, Derek Nimmo and Clement Freud, Paul Merton and Tony Hawks. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> and this particular edition of Just a Minute is being performed before a fringe audience at the Pleasance Theatre during the Edinburgh International Festival. And as usual, I'm going to ask our four panellists to speak, if they can, on the subject I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviation. Paul Merton, will you begin the show? And the subject, very aptly, for Edinburgh is the Firth of Forth. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? The Firth of Forth, so much better than the Third of Fifth, I find. <laughs> a stretch of water. I often, when I'm up in Edinburgh, go for a swim. I get up half past seven in the morning. I go down there. I go onto the bridge. I leave. And Derek Nimmo's challenge. Too many goes. Yeah, you yeah. were going too much there. I just there. get so excited yeah. about it. Oh, you were really a goer there. Right, Derek Nimmo. A correct challenge, so you get a point for that. You take over the subject, the Firth of Forth. There are 47 seconds left, starting now. Starting at North Berwick, it continues this great elbow of the sea, up river, ever again. Oh, um, yeah. challenge. So sorry. Deviation, I think. Oh, terrible. Deviation. El elbow, uh, elbow of the sea, I think, through him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Paul, I agree with the challenge and point to you for a correct challenge. 42 seconds are left for you to take the subject back. Firth or fourth, starting now. I bathe in the cool, clear H2O that just laps against my chin as I bathe. Oh. oh. <laughs> Derek. Well, it's not cool and clear, that's for one thing. Really. <laughs> well, everyone likes it, anyway. So that's well, deviation, cool. but there's also hesitation. Right, Derek, another correct challenge. 35 seconds for you, the Firth of Forth, starting now. My favourite village on the Firth of Forth is Cramond. I used to go and stay there as a child many years ago, 
had a house called Crammond House. And one called... <laughs> Clement Freud's house. Two Crammonds and two houses. Yes, there were. Absolutely. All right, don't rub it in, Clement. I mean, one's <laughs> enough. Sorry about that, Claire. I'm sorry, I'm not very attentive. Right? Clement Freud, correct challenge. 26 seconds are left. The Firth of Forth, starting now. I don't actually know a lot about the Firth of Forth, <laughs> other than that the temperature is not cool and the water is unclear. <laughs> it is, in fact, a filthy stretch of water. <laughs> Between. Uh, Tony Hawks are challenged. I thought I'd get in before the audience lynched. <laughs> He did repeat water as well. He did repeat water. Well done, Tony. Yes, so 12 seconds are left for you to tell us something about the Firth of Forth starting now. The Firth of Forth is a marvellous stretch of water. <laughs> oh, I love to wander down to it. It is the gateway to the north of Scotland, and you can go across the bridge and stand looking at the... <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever is speaking as the whistle goes gains an extra point, and it was Tony Hawk, so he's equal in the lead with Derek Nemo at the end of the round. Derek, your turn to begin the subject, Big Hands. Would you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Well, I haven't got particularly large hands myself, nor have I particularly wanted to help. I don't know why I said particularly three um, times now. Paul Merton. <laughs> particularly three times. Yeah, particularly, yeah. <laughs> Right, 51 <laughs> seconds for you on Big Hands, starting now, Paul. I think it was Anwar Sadat who had that hit record with you need hands to hold someone you care for. <laughs> and this is true because one of my favourite footballers when I was growing up was Pat Jennings, who played for Spurs at a time, and he had these enormous hands. One of his tricks was when the ball was coming across from the wing, he'd leap up like a salmon leaping out the fur for fourth <laughs> and grabbing the ball just like that, just in the middle of his huge... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Too just. Too yeah. just, yes. Fine, yes. <laughs> well, as he was a. <laughs> I would think we would call that not a popular challenge. <laughs> but it was a correct challenge, so I had to be fair within the rules of just a minute. And Derek, it was correct. You have 33 seconds. You take back. Big hands starting. What are these now. American expressions? I really rather hate they say, come on, give them a big hand, which means that someone needs desperately a bit of applause because nobody's ever heard of them. And they totter onto the stage, and then again they say, another big hand when they finish. Why they have to keep on reiterating those words, I do not know. There used to be a place called Near Dumfrieshire where they used to have hand facing. <laughs> big Paul Merton challenge. Deviation, there can't be a place called Near Dumfrieshire. <laughs> Unless it's very small. <laughs> You're on form tonight, Paul. Yes, correct challenge. 14 seconds, big hands, starting now. A big hand is usually given for somebody who's entertained an audience at some point. I agree with Derek, sometimes this is artificially put into the proceedings. But this case, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Clement Freud challenged. Uh, do you need this? Yes, yes, rescuing him as well. Five seconds, Clement. Big hands, starting now. Big hands is an anagram of bashing D. It's also <laughs> a city. Tony Hawk's challenged. I don't think it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mind you, I'm what guessing. You um... what, yes, you're guessing. Dashing, what did you say? Bashing. Bashing D. D. I think he's right, Why actually. Why are we suddenly doing crossword? You'd have to be. <laughs> There's half a second for you, Clement, on big hands, starting now. Large club. <laughs> so, at the end of that round, Clement Freud was speaking as a whistle. When gained that extra point, he's now in the lead, just ahead of Paul Merton and Derek Nimmo. And Tony Hawk's only one point behind those other two. Clement Freud, your turn to begin the subject. Influencing people. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. I think if you want to influence people, there's no better subject to talk about than big hands. <laughs> um, there are many who believe that large mitts or excessively big digits. <laughs> Paul Merton challenge. The repetition of big. Yes, you said the big is not on the card. That was last time. So 48 seconds are left, Paul, for you on influencing people starting now. Influencing people, of course, is an anagram of pinfluencing evil, <laughs> which is a little small town just outside Dumfries. Uh, sorry. Tony Hawk's your challenge. I'm afraid it isn't. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no K in influencing no, no, people. No, no, no. 
on this occasion, Tony, I definitely agree with you. So you had the subject of influencing people. There are 42 seconds left, starting now. There are many ways of influencing people with money, with fame. <laughs> Stan? Uh, Clement Freud. Two withers. Two withers. Yes. So, Clement, another point to you, and another, and the subject again, 38 seconds influencing people starting now. Mr. Chris Eubank influences people enormously with his fists. <laughs> Many have fallen onto the candle floor and been unable to get up again as a consequence of punishment by this black pugilist. Other ways of influencing people would be to persuade them to adopt a new policy politics of a kind they had not previously experienced or practiced, or possibly taking them for a walk in Scotland and showing them the beauties of the topography, the clear water, the fast running deer and hare. <laughs> the audience on the edge of their seats, Clement. They, they could almost see the mental wheels turning in your brain as you gain the extra point for doing so and have increased your lead at the end of the round. Tony Hawks, would you take the next round? Karaoke, or karaoke as some people pronounce it. There are 60 seconds on the subject starting now. At first I was afraid. I was petrified. <laughs> kept thinking I could never live now I spent so many nights so claiming I could keep you wrong. Do you think I'd fall? Do you think I'd lay down and die? No, not I. I this is a kind of song that people like to sing when they're doing karaoke. They get up there on that stage. It's their chance to have a little piece of stardom. And boy, do they grab it with both of their... <laughs> well, that is well, it's just patronising. <laughs> Their chance to grab a little piece of stardom. <laughs> well, it may be patronising, but it still wasn't deviating from just a minute. So, Paul, the audience like your challenge. I give you a bonus point for that. But Tony gets the point for being interrupted. Tony gets the point for being interrupted, right? And he keeps the subject. Okay, <laughs> okay. And, uh, Repetition, him, yeah. Repetition. Yeah. <laughs> So, Tony, you carry on with 34 seconds left, starting now. And now the end is here, <laughs> and so I face these young people. I said people. <laughs> Derek Nemo challenge. No, just the people. Yes, it was I nearly didn't say it that time, though, did I? I, I went 21 there. seconds, Derek, karaoke. <laughs> Starting now. I have some particularly dear friends called Leslie Melville who live in a place called Loch Lickett near Garve. And they have bought a karaoke machine. And it's an absolute nightmare. Because after a wondrous dinner, it's marvellous salmon and so on, one retires to play and sing karaoke. It is ghastly. You don't even fortify with a number of drams. It doesn't improve my voice. I sing absolutely horrendously <laughs> out of tune. What's, the matter? Freud What's the matter? Why are they friends? <laughs> They're yeah, friends because the fishing's very good. Yeah. <laughs> you deserve it. One second on karaoke starting now. Okay. Oh, me. Yes, yes. Cari ah. <laughs> One second. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes, Paul. <laughs> Two seconds, karaoke, starting now. Why does that <laughs> Right. So Paul Merton's got an extra point. He's leapt forward. He's equal with Clement Freud at the end of that round. They're both leading Tony Hawks and Derek Nimmo, who are equal in second place. And Paul, your turn to begin. The subject postcards. Will you tell us something about those in this game starting now? Whenever I'm away from home for a while, I tend to send postcards back to my loved ones and friends. I like to write them because I think you can express... Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. Why have I never got one, then? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it... <laughs> I did say friends and loved ones. <laughs> I mean, I send them on to the karaoke people all the time. <laughs> so you're not a loved uh, oh, right? Dear. So, but what was the serious challenge? Uh, no, there was no Sid. Did you not know? <laughs> <laughs> I was being frivolous. I'm Were so sorry. Right? Well, <laughs> I'll give you a bonus point for being frivolous, which because the audience enjoyed it. But he did actually repeat something which you didn't spot. And uh, you're uh, so clever, Nicholas. No. <laughs> 
I'm not. <laughs> 52 seconds, postcards starting now. George and Ethel Postcard are two of my oldest friends. They live just... You're a of friends. Yes, because you talked about sending postcards to your friends before, and loved ones. But if we mention the word friends, yes, it's repetition. It is, yes. right. So who are these George and Ethel postcards? <laughs> well, if Dave can... hadn't interrupted, I could have given you a oh, thumbnail right. picture. Because <laughs> <laughs> they get a bloody postcard, don't yeah. they? <laughs> Derek, 48 seconds on postcards, starting now. In 1972, I took my family to Saigon just before the Tet Offensive for a holiday. <laughs> there weren't many people there. Uh, at Paul the time. Chuck. What is this deviation taking your family to Saigon in the middle of. <laughs> Surely this is dreadful. It's true. Is it true? Mm. Oh, we'll carry on then. <laughs> I don't think he'd actually got underway and got to postcards. I think they were coming up. So, yes, uh, I give him the benefit of the doubt. 41 seconds, uh, Derek. Postcards I, starting now. I said principally I'd gone there so I could send a picture, a postcard, of tanks and bombs going off to my mother-in-law saying, wish you were here. <laughs> the great British postcard, of course, as done by Mr McGill, is, I suppose, one of the great... <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Uh, here's a dish. Yes, indeed, yes. Clement, another point, 26 seconds, postcards starting now. I think it's fair to say that it is a huge mistake to write private and confidential on a postcard <laughs> because so many people are likely to read the content and spoil the thrust of that simple message. I have sent postcards to people from every county in Ireland, 26 in the south, six in the north. <laughs> And Tony Hawk's a challenge. Repetition of six. Yeah, 26 <laughs> and six. Well, listen, Tony, and you've got in with four seconds to go on postcards starting now. Whenever I go away, I make a point of sending a postcard to Paul Merton. I will... <laughs> Yes, Tony Hawks was speaking then as the whistle went and gained that extra point. He's now in second place, just behind our joint leaders, Paul Merton and Clement Freud, and Derek Nimmo is one point behind him, and Derek, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is good nights. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? There are, I suppose, many good nights in Britain, and there are quite a lot of bad nights as well, and most of them belong to an order of chivalry, except for the knight's bachelor, who don't. So <laughs> Clement Freud is one of those very good knights, who is not one of a CV or anything like that. The orders are these. The first of all, there is the garter order. Something going, what's the matter? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was an uneasy noise behind me. <laughs> Something was coming up. Your challenge. Hesitation. Yes, the definitely. Right, was. Uh, I, I didn't want anyone to interrupt him if he was going to go on talking about me. No. <laughs> It's the cleverest way out of getting out of some ploy that I've ever heard of. But, Clement, you've got a point, you've got 39 seconds, you've got good night starting now. I blame Ovaltine. <laughs> and Derek Nemo challenged. It just sort of stopped. Didn't I knew he did. It, <laughs> it, it was a statement. It was a statement. <laughs> he had his Ovaltine and went straight to sleep. <laughs> 35 seconds, Derek, on good night starting now. I had a wonderful night last night with Emma Freud, the daughter of Sir Clement. We went to this extraordinary <laughs> where there were rats in a cage and clowns beneath, and they stealthily crept around these quadrupeds, and the stench was unbelievable. But this was a representation of some new kind of modern art, which this lovely daughter showed to me for the first time. I thought it very enjoyable. And then we went to see some statues and things from Sarajevo, piles of bricks. Quite fun. And then two bounces. And there she abandoned me this glorious, wondrous... I think I've seen she... Two years old. <laughs> So Derek Nimmo was speaking then as the whistle went. He was hesitating, deviating and repeating himself, but the others let him go because they thoroughly enjoyed it and so did the audience. <laughs> and you kept going to the whistle went and again an extra point. You're equal in second place with Paul Merton. Clement Freud's one ahead in the lead and Clement, your turn to begin the subject. Bunkum. Will you tell us something about Bunkum in this game starting now? Seven nines are 56. <laughs> if we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honour. Seems to me total bunkum. <laughs> almost as much, 
as getting the kings and queens of England in the right order, let alone the wrong one. I have several bits of advice to give people here. Go out and jump straight into the lake and you will become drier and warmer. Steal your bathroom towels. Do not book in to the Hickton Hotel because it is of no good to anyone. Bunkum. Tony Hawk's is challenged. He's on drugs. <laughs> We're going to have a dope test after the show, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you'll pass it, Nicholas. <laughs> I've been dopey for years. I made a good living out of it. You heard it here first. Yes. <laughs> I saw a sign in the car there that said, Grow your own dope, plant Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Eleven seconds, Tony Hawks, Bunkum starting nub. Muck nub. Clement Freud. Hesitate. No. <laughs> he came in very rapidly. Sixteen seconds, Bunkum, Tony Hawk starting now. I do not agree with the rest of the panel who sometimes say that Nicholas Parsons talks nothing but Bunkum. He has a difficult job to do up there, and my goodness, he gives it his very best. He falls some way short of being uh, average. <laughs> um... <laughs> Hesitation. No, I think it was deviation. I don't think. <laughs> oh, we can't wait for this decision. No, I can't. But right. Paul, what was your challenge? Deviation. <laughs> Clement challenged first for hesitation, which I disagree with, so actually, technically, Tony must keep the subject with three seconds to go on Bunkum starting now. Lord, look, Slummy, I've never been to a shop with those kind of trousers before on my ears. I want... <laughs> so, Tony Hawks was speaking as the whistle went... And he's now one ahead of uh, Clement Freud and two ahead of Derek Newman and Paul Merton. And he also begins the next round, Tony. The subject is bats. After Bunker, we go to bats, and you start now. Tabs is an anagram of bats. <laughs> Not very sophisticated, but I'm a beginner in that particular game. <laughs> now, I used to have a table tennis bat when I was little, and I was so thrilled that when I got my first one, which had sponge on it, this could really impress the other children at the school. Oh, my goodness, Tony's got a bat with that surface over the front of it. We are very scared at taking him on because he might beat us 11-0, and that would be a humiliation. So they didn't, and I had to find another sport to do instead, and I chose cricket. And I had a marvellous bat of that persuasion. It was wood, which is a good start, and it had a handle at the top. That's the best way to have cricket bats, I'll be. Very but uh, <laughs> never challenged. Did you have a handle at the bottom? I had it upside down. <laughs> that is not actually a challenge within just a minute, but he did repeat cricket, but you didn't spot that. 22 seconds, bats, Tony starting now. They fly about <laughs> at... Clement Freud. He repeated cricket. <laughs> They think you're mean, but I've got it within the rules of just a minute. Give it to you, Clement. 21 seconds on bats starting now. Stab is a good anagram of bats. <laughs> I just thought I would mention this. <laughs> well, he was so pleased with mentioning it, he sort of <laughs> just stopped. 50 seconds are left for bats with you, um, Paul, starting now. I used to live in this early Norman church, and there these bats in the belfry that would come down half past seven every night and start screeching, and you hear absolutely unbelievable noise. So one night I went up there with a shotgun, and I thought, I'm going to get rid of these little devils. <laughs> so I did it, they flew across, bang, there was one bat less than there had been before. So and then more bats... It just shows you how talented they all are, because Tony Hawkes was in the lead, but only one ahead of Paul Merton and Clement Freud, and they are only one point ahead of Derek Nimmo. And Paul Merton, it's your turn to begin. The subject is Parsons' nose. <laughs> there are 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. Nicholas Parsons knows that he's greatly appreciated by the great British public. They can't get enough of him. As long as they don't have to pay any money, they're quite willing to come along... <laughs> And watch something like Just a Minute being recorded at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Whether it's his natty style of dressing, his urbane manners, there's something about him that is quintessentially English. <laughs> I don't know. It's only Fox, you challenge. He's made up a new word there. Yeah. <laughs> quintessentially? It's quintessentially, I believe. Yes, I think it is, but I like I was it. using the 17th century pronunciation. <laughs> 
you, uh, you unfortunately... Probably because you think that was a century in which I was born or something. <laughs> Tony, I agree, deviation from the English language. So 38 seconds for you to tell us something about Parsons' nose starting now. If there is any deviation, hesitation or repetition that takes place on this particular programme, then... God, does Nicholas Parson knows. <laughs> I've made that not right, have I? <laughs> Paul Merton Challenge. It's a slight deviation from the English language, yeah. though. God, God does Nicholas yeah. Parson's nose. <laughs> it was rubbish, I know. Yeah, no. <laughs> Paul, 29 seconds, Parson's nose starting now. Nicholas Parson's knows that people will hate him. They can't... Clement Freud Challenge. He said Nicholas before. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes, right. Clement, do you have... How many seconds? 21 on Parsons' nose, starting now. I think quite an interesting thing of the British Broadcasting Corporation to have done was to introduce set-aside for Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> it means that he doesn't have to work and gets paid. <laughs> and the fact that you see him in this game today going through the motions of chairmanship <laughs> is actually a wonderful... <laughs> challenge. Hesitation. Yeah, and I'd have yeah. for deviation. <laughs> Five seconds on Parsons' nose starting now. Every Christmas we would look forward to the moment when my mother threw open the kitchen door and presented us with our... <laughs> Paul Merton speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and he's now one ahead of Tony Hawkes and then Clement Freud and Derek Nimmo in that order. And, Derek, your turn to begin. The subject breaks... Can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? I wish I had a break in the last question, really, because I wanted to talk about Parsons' nose, and in particular, that which lies beneath it, because I think the audience ought to know that he's wearing the most lurid blazer that's ever been seen north of the border, and a tie, because he has no shame, to match it. <laughs> and now I've had my break, I should probably move on and talk about breaks elsewhere for my car. Now, that actually has very poor ones. I had them fixed in the garage in Northamptonshire just before Easter, and they really don't work. So sometimes when I'm sliding down a hill and press on the brake pedal, it doesn't stop. And as a result of that, I went into a greenhouse in a village called Oni, demolishing a lot of plants and two cars that lay on either side of my motor vehicle. The car registration number is SXM5, if any of the constabulary in Buckingham are looking for me, and it would be very nice if they did find me, because I would like to... Have a call. Paul Merton. Hesitation, can. unfortunately. When? When he's stopped between words. <laughs> I think that that actually was a full stop. I think he In the middle of a sentence. No, I didn't notice him hesitate. Well, whether something. you noticed it or not, Nicholas, I can't be <laughs> held responsible for the few things that you notice in life. <laughs> Derry, I disagree with the challenge. You have five more seconds on breaks starting now. Playing snooker, of course, it's very important to get a really good break. If you watch that programme, it comes from the Crucible <laughs> Theatre. Gary Nimmo was speaking as a whistle went. He's still in fourth place. Um, <laughs> but he's only one behind Clement Freud, who's one behind Tony Hawkes, who's one behind Paul Merton. That is the order. We're moving into the final round. And, uh, Tony, it happens to be your turn to begin as well. The subject is Pippins. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? You might not believe this, but there was actually a girl at my school called Mary Pippins, who was <laughs> a dreadful girl who insisted on taking an umbrella everywhere she went, even if it wasn't raining, and had a list of her favourite things, but that's from another film, isn't it, I think? <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Pippins are apples. Paul Merton has challenged you. The hesitation, though. I know. He was so overcome with his joke, he couldn't get <laughs> it. <laughs> so, Paul, you've got Pippins. You've got 43 seconds starting now. I know Mary Pippins as well, and she's a wonderful individual. She's absolutely gorgeous. She walks down the street and everybody goes, Oh, look, there's Pippins. And that's exactly who she is. She walks round there. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, repetition of walk. She mm. was, uh, Pippins was doing too much walking. 32 seconds, Clement Pippins, starting now. I had quite an interesting conversation once with some farmers who grew apples in Wisbeach, and the Ministry of Agriculture had told me that the price of this fruit was going to collapse, and I told them, and one of my constituents was good enough to reply, you are wrong, apples are going up, and I said this will come as a body blow to Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> 
Pippins are probably the nicest growth of fruit in that there's room uh, space <laughs> between the flesh and the flesh. You have got exactly one second to tell us something about Pippins, Paul, starting now. I suppose my <laughs> So, Paul Merton, got in then before the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so, and I will now give you the final score. It is extremely close because they're all so good at the game. So, very few points separate Derek Nimmo, Clement Freud, Tony Hawks in that order, but just three points ahead of them all is Paul Merton. So, we say he's the winner this week, Paul Merton. <laughs> We do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. It only remains for me to thank our four outstanding players of the game and also Alison Harbert, who's kept the score and blown the whistle for us so magnificently, and also our producer, Anne Jobson, and, of course, particularly Ian Messeter, who thought of the game without whom we wouldn't still be playing it, and from me, Nicholas Parsons, until we take to the air once more and play Just a Minute from all of us. Goodbye. Welcome to Just a Minute. is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome the four exciting personalities who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome back one of the long-standing players of the game, Peter Jones, a more regular and frequent player of the game, Paul Merton, and two who have only played it on two occasions before, that is Jenny Eclair and Kit Hesketh Harvey. Would you please welcome all four of them? Beside me sits Liz Trott, who is going to keep the score and also blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And as usual, I will ask our four panellists to speak in turn, if they can, on the subject that I will give them. And they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviation. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the lovely city of Lincoln. And uh, the first subject we've got on the cards is mobile phones. No connection with Lincoln. But, Peter Jones, would you start the show and talk on that subject, if you can, starting now? I don't really like them very much because you can't attach answering machines to them, and that's a great advantage. <sighs> Jenny Eclair, you have challenged. I yes. challenged him because he's wrong, because obviously he's a bit of an old gimmer, and he doesn't realise <laughs> that you can get mobile phones now that um, do have answering services in them. Yes, What's I'm... the point of them? I don't know. Yes, I, also, I also don't have a mobile phone, but that's because I'm not very successful or very rich and famous. I know I've said very twice, but don't get me yet, all right. Would, would, you, would you like to save it all for the show? Because... Am I allowed to go on? No, no, I'm going to tell you to go on in a minute, Jenny. You haven't played the game very often before. No, but I have no I, idea. What I need to say is that you have a correct challenge, so yeah. you get a point for a correct challenge. Why is it and... correct? Because yes! what you said is it, true, man. actually. In today's modern technology... People have said the most monstrous things in this show <laughs> that are not true. I know, but this was... <laughs> but on this occasion, she was technically correct. So, Jenny, you have a correct challenge. You get a point for that, and you take over the subject. There are 54 seconds available starting now. I'm winning already. Good. Uh, I don't have a mobile phone because I don't have very much money. I'd like to because where I live... Oh, Peter Jones no. has challenge. Not true. She's loaded. <laughs> I've spent all my money on rubber gear and leather goods, so I'm not... <laughs> Steady on, Jenny. Remember, it's the family show. Now, uh, uh, Peter, we love that challenge so much. I'm going to give you a bonus point for a, a good challenge, but okay. it wasn't hesitation, repetition or deviation. So Jenny gets a point for being interrupted, keeps the subject. 49 seconds are left, Jenny, starting now. 
At my daughter's sports day, everybody but me had a mobile phone. Every time one went trill, all the people went down to dig out the mobile phone, like a tidal wave, like a Moroccan wave going down. And I joined in, even though I didn't have one, just so I looked big and important. And where I live in South East London... <sighs> oh, it, Peter's challenge. Repetition of wave. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Very down. dull of me. Where, I'm right. so sorry. So, Peter, you have a correct challenge. And you have a point, of course, for correct challenge. 34 seconds are available, and you still have mobile phones starting now. I can sit at home, you see, and wait for the person who's phoning me to speak and then decide whether I want to pick up the phone or not, which is a tremendous advantage. But not being able to get in touch with these people who supply... <sighs> Kit Hesketh Harvey, you I, have I think we've had an awful lot of people, haven't we? Yes, we did have people before. Yes, sorry, I did. Yes. Yes. So right. people gives you a point and the subject and 20 seconds, mobile phones, Kit, starting now. The problem is living in these bleak Fenland areas, as I do, that the mobile phone satellite system doesn't really network up at all, and so it's absolutely no use at all. You can't ring Tom Conti in Hampstead, should you want to ring that <laughs> self-same gentleman, because he's discovered that the, the lines are too busy to that place where he lives. However, nowadays, uh, the old <laughs> and <laughs> He's lost it totally. No, he, he did say, uh, which is hesitation. He's blown it completely. I'm so sorry. And anyway, he should lose points for living in the country. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Oh. 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 I'm sorry, I'm a town. One just... fell stroke, you've I'm alienated sorry. everybody. In they turn, they turn. Yeah, right. I just feel nervous if I can't see a sock shop out of the corner of my eye. I'm just not very good in the country, you know. Well, okay. so you needn't feel nervous now because you're way in the lead and you've got another point and another second to talk on mobile phones starting now. Where I live in South East London. Whoever is speaking as the whistle goes gains an extra point on this occasion. It was Jenny Eclair, and she's naturally in the lead at the end of the round. And Kit Hesketh Harvey, will you take the next round? The subject, Lincoln Green. Very apt for the city of Lincoln. But will you talk on that subject starting now? Of course, where we are sitting in this shatteringly beautiful city is called the Lawn, and so in some respects I suppose that is a Lincoln Green. However, more usually the subject is normally associated with Robin Hood and his merry men who wore that hue for their tights, all except for Will Scarlet, no doubt whose wardrobe consultant told him that these tones did not coincide with his own skin colours, and that <laughs> he should choose Crimson Lake or even Vermilion when choosing his stockings. Friar Tuck must have looked like an animated compost heap. <laughs> However, the fact that Robin Hood and his band of... I've done uh, it Paul twice. Paul so <laughs> Yes, repetition of Robin Hood. Yes, Robin and Hood. It would, and it would have become and his merry band of men. <laughs> so, Paul, there are 26 seconds for you to tell us something about Lincoln Green starting now. I don't know anything about Lincoln Green. <laughs> Peter, you I'm willing to have a go, though, if you like. <laughs> no. Well, actually, you pause, so Peter got in first, and he's got 23 seconds. I didn't pause, seconds. I stopped. <laughs> yes, it came to There's a There's nothing in the game about stopping. <laughs> Peter, a correct challenge, Thank 23 you. seconds. Tell us something about Lincoln Green starting now. And there's also Lincoln Amber and Lincoln Red. <laughs> though I've noticed the drivers pay no attention at all to these <laughs> colours. <laughs> they see traffic lights as merely a recommendation. <laughs> And I've noticed... Uh, well, I was nearly killed. A uh, kit challenge. Oh, we've had two notices, haven't you we? You noticed, yes. So oh, yes. Yes, you did. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 And so it's kit has got in with 30 eight. years still doing it. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but your contribution is without par. Eight seconds, Kit, on Lincoln Green, starting now. Green has, as Fraser said in his seminal work, The Golden Bough, always been the colour of the outlaw, Kermit the Frog, the man on the niblets. <laughs> So, Kit Hesketh Harvey was speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so. And at the end of the round, Jenny, Peter, and Kit are in the lead, equal, and followed by Paul Merton. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny Eclair, will you take the next round? The subject, jeans. Will you tell us something about that in your urban life? Well, Starting now. As it happens, I'm sporting a triumphant pair of rather sexy PVC jeans. <laughs> and they do make a funny squeaky kind of noise. So if you hear the 
strange sounds emanating from me. It's these, and it's a bit of heavy breathing from Nicholas, who I think is rather... <laughs> um, and of appetite. Kit has jumped. That's all right, I was overcome, but... Um, <laughs> so was a bit of an err as she sat down, which I don't think was squeaking PVC, was it? I know, <laughs> it was a definite verbal err. They don't look which... like jeans. They are a jean style, actually, Peter. Are they? Yeah. Believe me. Yeah. I know my fashion, darling. I would call them PVC <laughs> trousers, yes, I agree. But anyway, 45 seconds are available for jeans, and it's you, Kit Hesketh Harvey, starting now. There are many famous jeans in the world. Jean Harlow, for example, the great film star of the 30s, whose hair was even more peroxide and implausible than that of Miss Eclair. <laughs> was once in a boat, I believe, with the then First Lady, Margot Asquith, and the famous story is told how she called her Margot once too often, and... He's chattering on about someone called Margot now. We're on jeans, aren't we? Uh, no, I think he was relating jeans um, to Margot. Oh, I Margo. think he was deviating like crazy. <laughs> what do you mean, those, those trousers, dear? What can you be doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, benefit of the doubt to Jenny Eclair. 26 seconds on jeans. Jenny, starting now. Brutus, Lee, Levi, all different kinds of jeans. My favourite are the red tag 501s, which I like to wear very tight indeed, so they cut off my circulation. And uh, I have left the... Paul Merton challenge. Uh, hesitation. Yes, definitely. Jeans is with you. 18 seconds are available starting now. So Jean Harlow, she turns to Margot Asquith and she <laughs> says, how do you... And Margot Asquith says, well, look, you know, my name isn't Margot, it's Margot, the T is silent. <laughs> Peter like, Challenge. Repetition of Margot. Yeah, Margot and Margot, yes, right. Peter, you've got him with eight seconds on jeans. <laughs> starting now. Very difficult to buy a new pair of jeans because they sandpaper them and put them in washing machines with pebbles until they're threadbare. <laughs> <laughs> Jones was then speaking as a whistle went with that extra point. He's taken the lead ahead of the others. Peter, we're back with you to begin. The subject is gangsters. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? I'd never want to be a gangster myself. I think I'd rather be a member of Parliament. I'd ask <laughs> one question every day, and that would really keep me in the style in which I'm accustomed. <laughs> indefinite period. But being a filled full of lead or dump, or taken for a ride is something that uh, never really has appealed to me. <laughs> Kid challenge. Sometimes. So wasn't there was an error, wasn't there? Yeah, I think there was a definite error. There's more than dramatic. You're not allowed an error? No. <laughs> can't err in just a minute, not, I'm Not afraid. even a dramatic err? <laughs> No, no, it was overdramatic. 34 seconds, Kit, on Gangster, starting now. The huge, silty fields of Lincolnshire are manned by gangs of workmen who pick from them cauliflowers and cabbages and Brussels sprouts, <laughs> graceful maidens with ivory fingers and spelt figures. <laughs> Paul Mutton Challenge. He's got this off a Christmas card. <laughs> Men's with ivory fingers picking cauliflowers. <laughs> well, it's a long way from gangsters. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, it's a long way. I think gangmasters. Gang gang def def definite deviation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Paul, you've got in on gangsters. Twenty-two seconds are available. Starting now. Whenever I think of gangsters, I think of the svelte Al Capone with his ivory fingers just pointing <laughs> at somebody who was going to be bumped off next. Of course, he ran Chicago very much in the 1920s and in the 1930s as well. well that's not a repetition because 1930s. After that, ah. <laughs> Kit got in first with seven seconds. Gangsters, Kit, starting now. Of course, at that point, Jean Harlow was addressed by Margot Escoot, who said that the T is silent, as in Harlot. She, of course, was... <laughs> So, Kit Hesketh Harvey was then speaking as a whistle and gained an extra point for doing so. Kit, it's your turn to begin. The subject is spirits. Can you tell us something Spir about that? Spirit, you can take it any way you like. Starting now... Shakespeare, the bard of Avon, filled his plays and his dramatic landscapes with spirits. One thinks of Caliban saying, the isle is full of noises, or the Scottish queen saying, come, you spirits, which tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the top to the toe, brimful of dire... Uh, Peter's challenged. Don't ring us, we'll ring you. <laughs> I, I must say, it's the first time Harman's come on in just a minute and done an audition for the National. But, um, 
Peter, we love the challenge. We give you a bonus point because it was so amusing. But unfortunately, he didn't hesitate, deviate, or repeat anything. So he keeps the subject. Yes, he yes. said full twice. I know he did, but he got in first. I'm sorry, Jenny. If you want to play it like that, that's All fine. Right. But Jenny, Jenny. No, I'm ready, Nicholas. Let's keep going. Kids, you've got a point for being interrupted. Peter gets a point for an, an amusing interjection. 42 seconds are left. Spirit starting now. <laughs> Paul's challenged. Repetition of full. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> 42 seconds with you, Paul, on Spirit, starting now. Fools, fools. <laughs> and <laughs> Kit got back in again. All right, Kit, Paul, 39 seconds on Spirit, starting now. The Hindus, of course, call their spirits... <laughs> Paul, challenge. Repetition of, of, of course. <laughs> yes, you did Shakespeare, say of course. Shakespeare, of course. Oh, my Lord. Yes, yes, you did say of course before, I'm sorry. Paul was listening well. 37 <laughs> seconds are left. Spirits, Paul, starting now. My favourite spirit, about any doubt, is whiskey. I drink it by the gallon. In fact, I'm an alcoholic, and I like to take this opportunity to come out in front of... <laughs> Jenny, challenge. Drinking. Did you say drinking twice? No, I like to drink it. Oh, I'm sorry. And he said drinking before and drink it that okay, time. Okay, fine. No, 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 fine. Jan, I don't want to inhibit you. Give the ball back to no, Paul. No, no, that's a very precious it. moment for Paul. 29 <laughs> seconds, Paul. Spirit starting now. I'm glad to be able to say to you that I've been a fool in the past because I have consumed far too much alcoholic beverage for my own... <laughs> Kit Chan. A repetition of alcoholic. Yeah. Yes, it was alcoholic before, not alcohol. Well. I was trying to do a quick sort of re rewind in the mind to find out it was alcohol or <laughs> alcoholic, but it was a repetition <laughs> of that word. 20 indeed. seconds, Kit, on spirits starting now. Call their spirits gins, and gin is indeed my favourite <laughs> spirit. Uh, Jenny. Gin twice. No, it was gin and gins, man. The one was with oh, the DJ. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is get some points I here. know you are. And I don't want to inhibit you from trying, because we love having you on the show. But I have to be fair within the rules of the game. 17 seconds, Spirits Kit, with you now. Initially distilled, I believe, in the Low Countries, Holland or Belgium or some such, and it was brought over by the English soldiers who liked to mix it with their tonic under William of Orange. Ah! Uh, <laughs> deviation of ever I heard. <laughs> 16. That's still illegal on the island, man. <laughs> Deviation, I think you're right, Paul. Uh, eight seconds on spirit starting now. I've gone off the drink I mentioned earlier because the one I really like now is vodka. I think it's fantastic. I can't get enough of it. I drink it like water. I really do. I would. <laughs> yes, oh. Jenny. Oh, he said loads of things. No, he said drink, didn't drink, he? Drink, well drink. Well done. Yes, you're right, Jenny. <laughs> So Jenny's got in with half a second to go on Spirit starting now. Whenever I drink Spirit, I have a <laughs> So at the end of that round, Jenny Clare was speaking as a whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so, and she's um, still in fourth place. And, um, <laughs> but she's only one point behind Peter Jones, and he's one behind Paul Merton, who is two or three behind our leader, Kit Hesketh Harvey. Jenny, it is your turn to begin. Reflexology. Can you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? I have experienced reflexology in a chill-out room at a rave club because I am young and trendy. And this was, there was a man in a caftan reeking of patchouli and he got us all to take our shoes and socks off. And the whiff in there was like putting your face in a bag of cheesy watsits. <laughs> and I was lying on a rubber mat and I was very embarrassed because once I'd removed my foot apparel, I realised everyone could see that I'd bite my toenails really badly. <laughs> and what they do, reflexologists, is they tweak your toes a lot and say that's doing your liver a load of goodness. Peter Jones challenge. Repetition of toe. Yes. Toe and toes. A toe and toes, mm. I think. Mm. You think? I think, yes. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it anymore. Anyway. I know. Are you no, well, me? I don't want to spoil her effort, you know. No, but you've gone in because with a great Because I can chance. see she is pathetically desperate to get <laughs> to win this ludicrous game. <laughs> well, Peter, you were in the lead for quite a while. You've got another point. And you have 37 seconds on reflexology starting now. Well, it is based on the soles of the feet, and you can get any financial advisor to do something to them <laughs> which will probably have an effect in your head because it uh, goes to different parts of the body. You see, when you press various buttons, shall we say, in the base of the uh, lower part. <laughs> <laughs> Kids. Uh, well, hesitation. Yes, I was about to hesitation, but yes, yes, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. He's sorry. doing so well as well. Yes. yes. 18 yes. seconds. The mayor is nodding. The mayor is nodding. <laughs> and he's not going to sleep. No, of course. No, so, Kit, 
Reflexology is with you, 18 seconds starting now. Broadly speaking, as I understand it, it means that if you hit somebody's knee very hard with a sledgehammer, it moves. <laughs> I don't think this is an enormous conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Hesitation. Yes, indeed, Peter. And you have 10 seconds on reflexology starting now. It is one of the alternative medicines that are practiced in rather small rooms in Hampstead and other parts of London. And I've never actually attended. So Peter Jones was then speaking as the whistle waned, gained that extra point and moved into second place behind Kit Hesketh Harvey. Paul Merton, it's your turn to begin and the subject is heavy metal. Will you tell us something about that <laughs> in this game starting now? Heavy metal is a variant of rock and roll. It's a kind of very repetitive... <laughs> what <the> word is that? <laughs> Jenny, yes. Speech impediments. <laughs> Jenny, all right. sad, yes, really. Jason, yes. 55 seconds on heavy metal with you, Jenny, starting now. This is the kind of stuff that teenage boys like to play in their bedroom, which is preferable to the other kinds of things they do in their bedrooms. I've said bedroom <laughs> twice, but we know what we're talking about. Peter Jones. Anyway. Well, she did say bedroom twice. Yeah, the bedroom yeah. came in twice, yeah. yes. 49 seconds on heavy metal with you, Peter, starting now. Well, lead is one of the heavy metals. <laughs> Gold is the other. And uh, alchemists used to try to convert one into the other because it was much more uh, expensive. Kit Hesketh Harvey. Well, when there were two others. There were two others, yeah. I'm afraid there were. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. And 40 seconds for you, Kit, on heavy metal starting now. Axel Rose, Iron Maiden, Def Leopard, and Dana. There is a <laughs> difference in the last one, in as much as, as far as I know, she never released a heavy metal disc. I've always thought that Meatloaf was oddly rather cuddly, particularly after his last single, whose name completely escapes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Merton got in first. Yes. Uh, DVA, your single doesn't really have like a name like Brian. It's <laughs> sort, of, sort of title, isn't it? It's his last single, Whose Name I Can't Remember. All right, Paul, 24 seconds. Heavy metal starting now. One of the best heavy metal groups of the last 45 years was Ina Sharples and her <laughs> syncopated swingers. What a band this was. They could rock any town hall in the country. People would rush to see them, argue for the front row seats, try and get somewhere near the back where they could absorb the marvellous acoustics as they echoed around the room. Of course, the lead singer, as you know, was a very popular character in Coronation Street. And when she... <laughs> Paul Merton got the extra point then. Speaking as the whistle went, he's now moved uh, up to third place. He's one behind Peter Jones, who's two behind Alida, who's still Kit Hesketh Harvey, and Jenny is just Trailing, a little bit. Just only a little, mother, just a little. Peter, your turn to begin. The subject matches. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? They're very useful things to keep in a damp cottage. We had some, and we kept them <laughs> in a glass jar with a lid on it. They were invented in the last century, and a lot of girls used to manufacture them at great risk to their health because they got something called fossy jaw, which was because they used phosphorus in the making of these little things with the flip. Jenny challenged. Did he say making twice? No, I don't think no. so. No, I'm sorry, Peter. That's right. <laughs> Peter, you have another point, and you have 38 seconds on matches starting now. I don't know that I want that long. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, you challenge. Yeah. yeah, I just try to help him out. He's tired. No, you challenge. Yeah. Yes, hesitation. Yeah, that's right. Well done. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thirty-three seconds on matches, Jenny. Starting now. I once played in a rounders match when I was a brownie, and I caught the ball in the eye socket, and it really hurt me, and I started to swear, and I was sent off the pitch. Matches aren't very useful anymore because you can get lighters really cheaply. You can get four for a quid in the market near me, which is brilliant. Because you know children's parties when they want going home presents, you can buy them a lighter, you see, because that solves the problem. Is it balloon lighter, piece of cake, and go home? Uh, uh, Paul Merton's challenge. Repetition of lighter. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. there was a, too many lighters there. Yes. 12 seconds, Paul. Matches starting now. The first football match I went to see was Fulham versus Ina Sharples. And what a <laughs> game that was. Half time, nil nil, but she came out the second half. Uh, Jenny has challenged. Nil nil, two nil. Nil nil. <laughs> Well, listen, Jenny, four seconds on matches starting now. A very funny thing you can do with matches is to... Paul Merton Chance. Repetition of very. Yes, very, very. 
Oh, does it count when you go back? Oh, I didn't know. No, you just yes. said very, very. You, you someone had bothered to explain these rules to me, and I might have been able to play this game. No, what you said, you said, you said very, and then the next word was very as well. <laughs> So, it, in some cases, you could say that was repetition. Yeah. <laughs> oh. You can oh. actually also... You can't repeat a word that you've used if you've got the subject back again in that round. You can use those oh, words in another round. Oh, it's harder than you think, this. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Three seconds for you, Paul. Another point and matches starting now. Bryant and May have been producing matches now for nearly... <laughs> So, Paul Merton again, speaking as the whistle went left forward, he's now equal with Kit Hesketh Harvey in the lead, <gasps> but they're only one point together ahead of Peter Jones, and he's only two points ahead of Jenny Eclair. It is all very close. Kit <laughs> Hesketh Harvey, your turn to begin the subject. Impressionists, will you tell us something about those amazing people in this game starting now? That movement in late 19th century art, which is best evidenced by a visit to the divine little jeu de paume gallery in the Tuileries Gardens in Paris, was initiated by, I believe, Claude Monet, whose study and impression caused a scandal at the time, for he broke light down, do you see, from its constituent grey into little parts of blue and yellow and red and made it vibrate and tingle in a way that had never been seen before. Gauguin and Renoir and Matisse and various others... Jenny Judge. He keeps saying and. Yes, there were a lot of and. Yes, there were a lot of and. Yes, we le often let one yeah, or two sorry. go, but uh, three or four. I was jolly well there. I know, you were yeah, marvellous. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> 32 seconds for you, Jenny, on Impressionists starting now. My favourite Impressionist is Rory Bremner, a comedy chum of mine and golfing partner. And his mother came to see me once work, because we worked together. I've said work. No, work and work. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, Jenny. That's it. You see, don't draw attention to your no. faux pas because often, no. at the pace you go, they may miss it. It's a yes. hilarious anecdote. Yes, uh, but Peter got in first. Peter, there are ten seconds on Impressionists starting now. The best Impressionist I ever saw was a man called Afrique, A-F-R-I-Q-U-E. He was from South Africa, and he made a very daring impression of the <laughs> Duke... <laughs> Peter Jones, speaking of the whistle when gain the extra point. And Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject, juggling. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? There are many things that can be juggled. Spoons, golf balls, cheese, apartment blocks, aardvarks, tortoises, porpoises, dolphins, whales, railway stations, beer mats, labels of all kinds, baked bean tins, cottage cheese, air vents... Yes, kids challenge yeah, Repetition of cheese. Mm. Yes, there was more than one cheese there. there. Yes, one cheese. Yes. Yes. Okay. there was mm. too many cheeses in the air at the time. Right, 38 seconds, juggling with you, kids, starting now. Cosmopolitan always advertises itself as the magazine for women who juggle their lives. I think this is balls. Most of the time, <laughs> when I juggle, that is precisely what I use. Ball challenge. Repetition of juggle. Uh, yes, oh, the subject fiendish. is juggling. Yes, <laughs> Just Definitely. to remind the listeners, you are allowed to repeat yeah. the subject on the card, but on this occasion the subject was juggling and not juggle. So, well, listen, Paul, 29 seconds of juggling starting now. Emulsion paints, <laughs> cricket greens, <laughs> doorknobs. The list is endless, and, of course, there are many people who are particularly good at juggling. They're called jugglers, in fact, which is just as well, because that's what they do. And I've worked with some very, very, very fine... <laughs> <experiment>. Oh, <yeah. laughs> Not two, but three on that occasion. And Jenny got in first. 14 seconds yes, on juggling Jenny boring, starting now. Um, it just kept going down. Uh, <laughs> I already started. You did. It was, you, you said, uh, I said starting now. You my friend, Peter. I don't no, know I what gave you that impression. <laughs> Thirteen seconds on juggling, Peter, starting now. Monsieur Eddie Gray was a wonderful juggler and a very funny man because he was a comedian as well. And he told me that Anona Wynne was crazy about him. <laughs> you remember her, don't you? Well, he, she wasn't, of course. And... <laughs> oh, 
Well, I'm afraid we have no more time to play just a minute. Uh, at the end of that, it was a very close, well, hardly a contest because it's the fun that's more important, but Jenny Eclair, who's only played it twice before, finished only just in fourth place behind Peter Jones and Kit Hesketh Harvey. No, you didn't lose. You were a winner. You just didn't get as many points as the others. <laughs> Um, who were um, equal in second place, but only two points ahead of them was Paul Merton, so we say he is the winner this week. <laughs> As I said then, there are no losers in just a minute, but somebody gets more points than the others. <laughs> <laughs> So it only remains for me to say thank you to our four bright panellists and also to Liz Trott, who has kept the score so well, and also to Ian Messiter, who created the game and helps to keep us all in work, and our producer, Anne Jobson, and me, Nicholas Parsons. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. We'll want to tune in again at the same time next time we take to the end play Just a Minute. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>